Renee, if you can hear me, can we do a mic check with you, please? Hi, John, can we do a mic check, please? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. All right. Renee, if you can hear me, can we do a mic check with you, please? Are you doing mic checks? Did you want me to test sharing the screen also or no? That would be great, yes, thank you. Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi, Paul, can we do a mic check, please? Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Renee, I think you might need to disconnect and reconnect. I'm not seeing your video or getting any audio from you. Hi, Moretta, can we do a mic check, please? Yes, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, Supervisor Lee. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes, Dave. Thank you. This is Otto Lee. Can you hear me clear? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks very much. Very good. Thank you. Hello, Catherine, can we do a mic check, please? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jackie, can we do a mic check, please? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Hi, Renee. Can you do a mic check, please?
Hi, Renee. Can you hear me? Dr. Smith, can we do a mic check with you, please? Yeah, can you hear me, David? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Renee, if you can hear me, let's do a mic check, please. Might still be having some connection issues. Hi, Doug, can we do a mic check? Check, check, this is Doug. We can hear you, thanks. Hi, Miguel, thanks. can we do a mic check with you, please? Hi, David. Can Hello, Miguel, me? how are you? Dr. Cody, can we do a mic check, please? Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Hello, Supervisor Simidian. Can we do a mic check, please? This is Supervisor Joe Simidian. We can hear you. Thanks very much, sir. Thank you. Why don't we go ahead and begin? All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. The hour of two o'clock having arrived, uh, we are ready to call to order our March 17th regular meeting for the Health and Hospital Committee here at Santa Clara County. Let me ask the clerk to begin by calling the roll and establishing the presence of a quorum. Good afternoon, Vice Chairperson Lee. Good afternoon, President. Thank you, Chairperson Simidian. Here, and that means that uh, both members are present and a quorum has been established. Uh, let me move next to public comment. Public comment is that portion of our agenda set aside for comments by members of the public on non-agendized items properly within the jurisdiction of the committee. Uh, let me ask the clerk, how many folks do we have uh, who've uh, indicated a desire to speak under public comment? We currently have three speakers, sir. Okay, I'm going to make this the last call because we have a tight agenda today. So if you want to speak under public uh, comment, uh, this is the last call. Madam Clerk, how many do we have? Still three, sir. All right, then we're going to cut it off there, I'm afraid. Uh, we're going to go ahead and hear from those three speakers. And folks, let me just ask you, if you can do it in less than three minutes, please do. We have a very full agenda today, and I want to ask for your help in making sure we have the time to get to uh, some important items, particularly because Supervisor Lee, I know, has a four o'clock commitment that's going to pull him away early. Who is our first speaker? And welcome. Thank you. Our first speaker is Ken Harowitz. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Ken, if you could unmute, please. Uh, this is Dr. Ken Horowitz from the Health Advisory Commission. And I want to invite all of you that are listening in to um, come and our Zoom meeting is tonight at 6.30. As you all know, the COVID-19 has significantly impacted the health of Santa Clara County residents. And we also know that having one or more chronic disease like obesity, diabetes, heart disease will significantly increase your risk. So tonight, our Health Advisory Commission will begin the discussion about chronic diseases and to look at whether functional medicine or integrative medicine um, is something that we need to be considering. We do approve of allopathic medicine, but I think today that there is good reason to look at alternatives in our healthcare system. As you have pointed out, Supervisor Submitting often about the healthcare system, whether it's healthy and not caring and not a system. We are going to begin the discussion tonight, and I hope anyone who's interested will participate at our Zoom meeting tonight at 6.30 of the Health Advisory Commission. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And let me ask the clerk to uh, call up our next uh, speaker under public comment. Our next speaker is Scott Largent. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Largent. I uh, like to uh, research things. Um, I, I, I kind of want to know both sides of every situation, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, I, I, I spent a long time in my life um, 
working on circuit boards and electronic components and um, you know kind of chasing a lot of different things electronically and um, this is why this stuff uh, sometimes fascinates me and sometimes upsets me what I'm trying to figure out is what is wrong with our behavioral health system and why nobody shows up I, I find that shocking budget of 526 million dollars I, I don't understand. It's inhumane. It's wrong. And uh, you guys need to start doing something about it. I put up several videos today. Uh, one is Black Joe versus the light rail. And the other one is fresh out of rehab and dropped off at St. James Park. They're very alarming videos. I was able to talk to a lot of the neighbors in the areas where this stuff was happening at. And the feedback was, we call, we call, we call. They keep calling behavioral health, they keep calling the police, the paramedics, you know, everything under the sun, nobody shows up. And what they're doing now is they're just moving out of downtown. They're saying, hey, city, county, they don't really care. Uh, some of my uh, supporters in the beginning of getting sober and, and these, these, these men were, were, you know, very good to me. Um, they would always check in on me, uh, Reverend Moore, uh, Walter Wilson with the NAACP, and then also um, a really good San Jose police officer, Officer Robinson. Um, they always wanted to make sure I was okay. And, and I respect that, I appreciate that. And, and they're good men to have my back in a really, really bad situation. I started to learn more from them about uh, American descendants of slavery and what the difference is between African-American, black and ADO, ADOS. Um, this was enlightening information um, of course, I'm white, and there's a lot of things I, I don't understand, but I want to have the conversation. I don't want to be afraid to talk about things like this. Uh, same with the LGBTQ issues. Uh, people are a lot of times, they'll tiptoe around things and they can't say exactly how they feel. My question for you uh, as supervisors, even the county executive, why are there so many black, mentally ill, homeless people left to die in our town? Can somebody answer that for me? It just doesn't seem right. It seems like black lives really do not matter in Santa Clara County. So you guys put up all these signs and banners and make statements that you really care, put your money where your mouth's at and start pulling these people out of the street, or should I say out of traffic? They need adequate care, they need help and, and start doing your job, please. This is inhumane, it's wrong. Our next speaker is Susan Irizari. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Susan Irizari, and I am a physician assistant at Valley Medical Center. I am a, I'm currently deployed as a disaster service worker, helping vaccinate our community to stop the spread of COVID-19, and I am a proud member of SCIU Local 521. More importantly, I am a mother of two beautiful, healthy children, and I am a wife to a frontline firefighter. Our life's work has been dedicated to the health and safety of Santa Clara County families. Over the last year and a half, the leaders on this community uh, committee have turned a blind eye to the uh, reprehensible tactics employed by your labor relations staff overseen by the Employee Services Agency. On March 1st, uh, neutral arbitrator decided I was wrongfully suspended based on facts overlooked by your labor relations staff. The order to reinstate my employment and fully restore my lost wages with interest is vindication from the county's efforts to defame my character and circumvent the rights of our union. Despite Teresa Moran's falsely claiming I pose some kind of threat to the county, that I was a danger and a liability, not once was my competency and dedication as a physician assistant ever called into question by the arbitrator. Thankfully, my union has a strong contract enforcement department that took up this fight and stood by me at every step. Our union gives us the power to expose the truth and hold our managers accountable, which is exactly what we are doing now. I am not looking for an apology or recognition of the hurt the county has inflicted on my family. The time for that has come and gone. However, I would like to, I would like you to prove me wrong. The inaction of this committee so far has shown me that nobody here is really interested in holding your staff accountable from labor relations to the medical staff, even the director of advanced practice 
who the arbitrator specifically called out for her dishonesty in telling physician assistants that maintaining national certification is a job requirement. No such requirement has ever been negotiated with SEIU. Despite very strong words from the arbitrator denouncing the county's unlawful conduct, it seems the county still intends to unilaterally change the job requirements of physician assistants through your medical staff which is now the subject of an unfair practice charge that SEIU filed with the state of California. As a labor union, there are a lot of big issues facing us during this public health crisis, ranging from outsourcing healthcare positions in our hospitals, reducing urgent care hours and behavioral health, even eliminating essential social work positions. As a governing board, you have a, a fiduciary responsibility to know that by continuing to ignore our right as a union to participate in these important decisions affecting our employment, it's just going to keep landing you and the people who provide expert counsel to you in more legal trouble. If you continue sanctioning the kind of conduct that has now made the county liable for more than three. That concludes our speakers, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And um, I uh, am sorry that we had to cut somebody off there, but apparently they hit their full three minutes. So um, that takes us uh, next to uh, item number three, which is to approve the consent calendar and changes to the committee agenda. Uh, let me just check in with my colleague, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Lee, my understanding is you have a four o'clock meeting and uh, uh, can't be in two places at the same time. Am I understanding this right? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, <clears throat> and I do have a couple of uh, suggestions to see if you might be agreeable to moving items four and five to the consent calendar. What I'd like to do is move uh, items four and five uh, quickly, and then if you're amenable, take up items six, eight, and 10 thereafter. My understanding is that uh, those are items you would like to be uh, certain you can be here for. So I think we can do items four and five expeditiously. So could we, could we get a motion to uh, approve the consent calendar as contained in our published agenda, but to reorder the agenda so that we will hear items one through five, then take six, eight, and 10, then go back to seven and nine and ultimately 11. I think that's the best we can do under a difficult set of circumstances. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. is that, is that a, did I hear, I, I think I heard a so move from- Yeah, so moved, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. I will second it. Let me check with the clerk to see if we have speakers. We do not. In the absence of any comment, then uh, let's call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Uh, without objection, uh, the uh, consent calendar is approved unanimously, uh, as are the changes to our committee agenda today. And again, if folks are trying to follow along, we will take items four and five, uh, and uh, then uh, six, then we'll go to eight and 10. So four, five, six, eight, 10, seven, nine, and 11. And again, I know that's a bit confusing, but I'll try and repeat it as we go. Uh, so let's go to item number four. I believe Dr. Krennis is on the uh, meeting with us, and uh, we'll ask her to present. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Thank you very much. I'm here. My name is Yvonne Kranis. I am the president of the Enterprise Medical Staff, and I'm here to present the credentials report, as well as the Enterprise Radiation Oncology Privileges and the Physician Assistant in Radiology Privileges for SCVMC, and answer any questions if you have them. Thank you very much, Dr. Kranis. Um, Supervisor Lee, we are asked simply under uh, 4A, B, and C to approve the appointments uh, and privileges. Can I get a motion to that effect? Yes, so moved. And I will second. Let me ask the clerk, anyone to speak on this item? No speakers, sir. Thank you, then please call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank motion you. carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Karnas, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you takes us to item number five, and uh, item number five is uh, the monthly uh, report from facilities and fleet uh, with respect to the Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and the Behavioral Health Services Center. Uh, we had an extended report at uh, recent meetings, uh, so no need for that. Let me just ask uh, Dr. Smith if I have a couple of questions about 
uh, our timeline and making sure as I try to do each month that we're uh, still on uh, the timeline that we had uh, been given previously. Who would you like me to address those questions to? Dr. Smith, are you with us? Uh, I see Mr. Lorenz leaning in. Thank you, Mr. Lorenz. So good afternoon, Chair Sumidian. Um, I just have a, a, a few brief updates from facilities. One is that we have, in fact, submitted our foundational structural plans to Washpaw for review. Um, we do anticipate that uh, through the collaborative review process that we will be able to meet within the next week and move the project along. Our objective is actually to have the foundation work to begin in early October of, or November of this year. Um, we are moving forward with the uh, parking structure uh, demolition, um, but that is dependent on the CEQA document being approved. And with respect to the CEQA document, we do plan on um, bringing that to the board on May 4th. It is currently out for public comment um, and it closes on April 4th. So we forgive, me, forgive me, Mr. Lorenz. I heard April and I heard uh, May. What's the timing again on the environmental review document? I just, I got a little confused there. Yeah. So uh, the public comment period actually closes on April 4th. And then we plan on returning uh, to your board for approval of that, of that plan on May 4th. Got it. And um, demolition uh, is uh, anticipated, at least we hope, uh, in June on the garage. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, no, uh, we do plan on uh, actually in October, and November, we plan to begin the, the demolition and the construction effort relative to the foundation. Um, so it could begin much earlier than that to prepare for that. I see Dr. Smith has arrived. Uh, Dr. Smith, anything you want to share? Uh, I, uh, part of the reason I asked the question about the demolition is that I'm looking at packet page 40, page 205, where it indicates that the demolition of parking structure three and excavation for the new psychiatric facility is projected to commence in June of 2021. And I, I just, uh, and I, I, you know, I understand there are a lot of moving parts here, so I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to play gotcha games. Actually, what I'm trying to do is make sure that uh, if we are able to move that quickly, that um, I know from uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's participation on the committee in uh, past years that she's uh, always been um, very clear about her uh, very reasonable hope and expectation that we'll do outreach to the community and uh, won't suddenly have uh, somebody knocking down buildings with people in the neighborhood uh, asking themselves what on earth is going on. So uh, can we can we get a commitment from staff to do that kind of outreach, please? Yeah, sure we will. Um, we've already been doing some outreach, but you're absolutely correct. We will do more uh, because oftentimes communities don't you know, necessarily notice it until you start tearing things down. And we want to know they want we want them to know before that happens. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Smith and uh, Mr. Uh, Lorenz. And then uh, I think it's just a uh, a question of uh, updating the timeline document, but uh, again, on page two of five, pack of page 40, we still have the construction indicated as November of 21 through November of 23. And uh, I had asked for a clarification at a prior meeting that uh, in fact, we would plan to open the facility in November of 23. I don't think this represents a delay or a change, but I just, I want to, could I, could I, if I see Mr. Lorenz shaking his head, which is a delightful answer, could I just ask gentlemen that uh, if, if in fact we still are on, on track to open in November of 2023, that the document reflect that when it comes back to us next month, please. We will. And, and obviously I don't want the document to reflect something that's not gonna happen. So if the answer is um, that's not gonna happen, then that's a conversation we should have. But here again, I notice looking at page three of five that it says uh, staff continues to work with the design team uh, with the goal of activating the facility in, in November of 23. So I think it's just a, 
making sure the chart and the pros uh, match each other. All right, then um, uh, forgive me with my screen. I can't tell absolutely positively everybody who's on the program, but uh, I am looking at the timeline, as I say, that uh, we've been working with in uh, considering this matter over the last uh, quite some time. And um, let me just uh, say, I'm looking at the, the timeline on page two of five that shows um, Oshbod review from uh, February of this year to March of next year with construction uh, being November of this year through October, November of next year with activation in 2023 of uh, November. Let me just ask uh, the various parties uh, if Mr. Koenig's on the uh, call or in the meeting, Mr. Koenig, is that uh, still a timeline we're prepared to meet? Chair sure, Simidian, uh, Mr. Koenig had a family emergency to attend to. Okay, thank you. Well, we wish him well, please. Uh, yes. tell, we hope, hope things are good. And how about Mr. Ohashi then? Yes, yes. we are on track. Thank you, Mr. Ohashi. And uh, how about Mr. Sodi? Our, uh, Capital Projects Manager. Are we on track? I believe uh, Mr. Sodi had a medical appointment to attend to. All right. <clears throat> I, I just want to say, Mr. Hashi, they're leaving all the weight on your shoulders, sir. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, not quite because I'm going to see if Mr. Draper's on the call. All right, then I'm going to say, Mr. Lorenz, we on track to meet the timeline that's contained in the packet? Yes, sir, we are. Dr. Smith? Yes, sir, we are. Thank you all. And uh, let me turn now after saying thank you again and uh, making sure that we follow up on the outreach if there's any uh, even uh, demolition uh, and that we uh, correct the timeline to reflect the activation date, see if there are any comments or questions from uh, Supervisor Lee or if he would simply like to move that we receive the report. No question, and I'm ready to uh, move to receive the report. This is okay. All right, we have a motion to receive the report, and uh, I will second. Let me check with the clerk, see if we have any speakers on this item. No speakers, sir. We do not. Uh, call the roll, please. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank motion you. carries. Uh, Unanimously, and that takes us to item number six. And again, for those of you who may have just joined us, we're uh, going to uh, change our uh, uh, schedule just a little bit. We're going to take up items six, eight, and ten in that order, and then we'll go back and catch seven, nine, and uh, get to eleven. So, item number six, the Alco project. Uh, who would like to projects? Uh, who would like to present on this? Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Samidia and Supervisor Lee Sherry Terrell with Behavioral Health Services Department. Uh, we have Catherine Aspiris from Behavioral Health Services Department and Roger Suhu from uh, Facilities and Fleet that will provide the updates. Great. Welcome to you both. Please feel free to bring us up to date. I know we've got some late breaking paper. Yes, so in the legislative file that was submitted, um, we did include an updated timeline to the go live of the ALCO sites for both Palo Alto and San Jose. Um, the construction completion date for in the legislative file was um, estimated to be completed for San Jose on, sorry, on um, April 16th. Um, and then, or sorry, April, sorry, February April 16th with the activation date of May 28th. And then uh, for Palo Alto, oh, my apologies. It was actually April 21st for San Jose with the activation date of June 1. And with Palo Alto, the intended was April 16th with the activation of May 28th. Um, there were delays with um, some of the construction and issues that were brought up um, more recently regarding the ceiling and the cabling trays. Um, we can also check in with Roger Soho about some of those items, but we have provided an off-agenda memo to include the updated timeline for both sites, um, and the both sites are um, expected to be open on June 25th. We will have a completion date of a uh, construction completion date for Palo Alto by May 14th, with uh, six weeks to activate the site. That will include um, 
installation of furniture and end user devices and equipment. And then for San Jose, the construction to be completed by May 26th with active, a four week activation by June 25th to open um, June 25th. Okay. Um, we just seem to have no end of the delays here. Um, Supervisor Lee, I've got some comments and questions, but why don't I see uh, if you'd like to weigh in first? Actually, I have no comments on this one. Uh, go ahead, Chair. Sure. Thank you. Um, let me let me just say that uh, as I had indicated, I would uh, I have asked for uh, our uh, folks, our contractor at Harvey Rose Associates, to do a what we call a forty hour audit to identify uh, why we've had the delays we've had in this process, and. That is in part because of my concern about these two specific sites, the North County site in particular, since it's in my district, um, but also because I uh, am frankly concerned about the uh, process repeating itself over and over again. Um, while the, um, the materials indicate that the original schedule called for activation in October of 2020, um, uh, my my notes uh, going back to 2019 uh, actually indicate that we had hoped that we'd be opening up in May of 2020, and um, you know of course we've got now not one not two but three updated schedules. Uh, even if we start with October the 15th, and I guess today's most recent makes the fourth updated schedule. Dr. Smith, it's 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 hard to feel like our um, our facilities and fleets team are 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 on it. Uh, you know, we have had. I, I'm more familiar with the Palo Alto site, as I indicate. I, I think we had a lease on that one back in October of 19. So, you know, to to have possession or access, and you know, now a year and a half later, somebody's identifying work to be done. It's just it's it's hard to fathom. Any any thoughts you want to share? Um, and is there anything that we can do to make sure that we don't experience further delays? Um, I don't have any brand new thoughts to share, except that, that we're all frustrated by the delay. And we will go back and look at it again and see if there's something we can do to speed it up um even faster than the data that you've got right now um but um may might be uh helpful to ask uh, for roger to give us an explanation of why the dates have changed in the recent recent past well we've got the explanation in the staff report and i don't i don't want to belabor this i, I just I feel like every time uh, there's an expression of concern here, it falls on deaf ears and it just keeps taking longer and longer. And and here's here's what I wanna say to all of the staff and Ms. Terrell, I know that you and uh, your team understand this even more painfully than I do. And Ms. Asparis, please understand, I'm, I'm looking at you right now on my screen and I'm saying thank you for everything you're doing to try and get this thing to uh, to, to open up. But this isn't just a frustration about a process that seems to never land on done. As I've indicated previously, when we've been talking about these services, we've got real, real pain out in the community, young people who are desperate for these services. And every day's delay is another day we're not delivering. And, and you know that's you know forgive me for making it so personal but as i said when we talked about the adolescent psych facility you know the the things that are here in the north county where i grew up uh, you know i've got kids who are graduating 
or were scheduled to graduate from the same high school I went to all those years ago, who will never see a graduation day because they're taking their own lives. And so, you know, it, it's not just a nuisance, it's not just an aggravation, it's not just a delay, it's the knowledge that there's some kid who desperately needs our help on any given day that we're not getting to because this takes longer and longer and longer. So, you know, as they say, Mrs. Sparris and Mr. Rio, I, I know, you know, you all get that, but I just, I, I want folks to understand, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not just frustrated at the sort of bureaucratic delays I'm, or the construction delays. I, I, I'm, I'm genuinely anxious about what toll that takes when we're not there to deliver for people who need our help. And that's just as true in San Jose or any other community. I happen to be most familiar with the site in Palo Alto because it's within my district, as I said. So. Dr. Smith, I do note in the staff report that there are, um, uh, I'm looking at uh, packet page 47, page four or five of the memo, that there is discussion uh, about uh, the potential for efforts to, at a minute, I'm quoting now, at a minimum, assure there are no further delays, uh, and uh, such as hiring extra crews, working multiple shifts, or paying for expedited reviews or priority inspections. I, I don't want us to waste money, but I, I really do think our, our team needs to be on this uh, so thoroughly that we um, that we make this the last of our updated schedules because we're, we're on about our fourth or fifth updated schedule now. Okay? Yes, uh, we understand, sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee, I want to come back to you one last time. Uh, make sure that there are no comments or questions from you. I'm going to turn to the clerk in a minute and say... Um, uh, do we have any speakers? No comments for me. All right, then if I could uh, ask for a motion from Supervisor Lee to receive the report and direct staff to identify any and all practical means of expediting these two projects uh, and uh, or at a minimum ensuring there are no further delays, I would be grateful for that motion. Yes, so moved. Motion by Lee, second by Stamidian. Let me check with the clerk to see if we have uh, comments from members of the public. No speakers, sir. All right, then let's call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Stamidian. Aye. Thank you. And that motion passes, thank you. Uh, that takes us to uh, item eight on our revised schedule. And again, for those of you who may just be joining us uh, in order to uh, see if we can accommodate various schedules. We're going to take items six, eight, and 10, and then go back and pick up seven, nine, and 11. So item number eight, this is the uh, Asian Pacific Islander health assessment update. Uh, it grew out of a referral that uh, uh, I did, gosh, back in May of 2016. Uh, I was joined in that effort by Supervisor, then Supervisor Cortese, uh, who would like to present from staff. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. Uh, uh, Rhonda McClinton Brown, uh, the Healthy Communities Branch Director, will be providing the report. Could you give us a, a, um, a thumbnail on how much time we have for this report so that we can uh, gauge accordingly? Sure. How much do you think you need to walk us through the um, the slides? Uh, I, I ask ordinarily, I might. Uh, emulate my colleague, Supervisor Wasserman, and say we had it and we read it. But of course, as you know, on this particular item, the uh, paper arrived late. So how much, if you uh, walked us through it the way you feel would be, you know, most desirable? Uh, Rhonda, are you on? You could probably speak to that. Hey, there we go. I am on. I was unable to mute myself. Um, you know, I was thinking, oh, um, you know, 10, 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes at max, I think that we could uh, uh, do this. I've lost my document though, so you'll have to give me just one minute uh, to bring it back up again. All right, well, why don't, we, why don't we say 15 minutes, take the time you need to make your way through the material uh, comprehensively. And um, uh, I don't think it will come as a surprise to you or Dr. Cody that one of the topics that I 
we'll want to pick up on uh, at when we get done is the API Community Health Worker Program that was a follow-up uh, to the original assessment. So let us know when you are ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Rhonda, if you want me to put the presentation up, I can. I think I have it now. Thank you. Okay. I I moved uh, to a different room where I could. Um, oh, I thought I had it. I think I have it. Yeah, it's not letting me share for some reason. I had it up earlier, but it won't let me share now. Well, okay. Dr. But Dr. Smith, you're a good sharer. Why don't you go ahead and share? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, this is in uh, PDF format, so it won't be as slick as a, a PowerPoint, but we can get through it. Can you see oh, it sure. now, Rhonda? That's, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. You can move it to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. So just to start, I just wanted to say that um, the API, I was going to give you a little bit of a background. Um, the API population in Santa Clara County is very diverse socially, economically, culturally, linguistically, and geographically, and has been growing um, significant over the last uh, several years or decades even. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is just a quick slide of the population that you could see the growth over time. Um, and it's projected um, at the bottom, you can't quite see it, but by the year 2060, you'll see that the um, Asian Pacific Islander population will be, will be the majority. Right now, we're about 35% uh, um, of the population in Santa Clara County. You can go to the next slide. And this is just a beginning of um, showing the, the diversity in the community. Um, um, and by subpopulation. And so I wanted to highlight that these are the populations that are most populous within the API subgroup. And these are the populations in which we focused our Asian health assessment on. You can go to the next, next slide. And again, particularly in the senior population, because I, I wanted to highlight this slide because the senior population needs um, came up quite a bit um, during the um, assessment period. And so you could see that um, there are disparities in income while the overall Asian um, Pacific Islander population um, ha has diversity of um, um, income and, and not all are low income. But when you look at the seniors, you do see that there are some disparities and more needs among seniors living in poverty. You can go to the next slide. So I want to just give you a little bit of a background of um, what, what brought us to today um, and the leadership, of course, that we've had from the Board of Supervisors. So our phase one um, of the health assessment started in 2016 when the public health was directed by the Board of Supervisors, I think at the leadership of, of uh, Supervisor Joseph Simidian and Dave Cortese uh, to institute an Asian health assessment. The goal of this assessment was to provide a profile of the health status among the largest agent subgroups that I had mentioned earlier. Um, and this assessment included both a utilization of secondary surveillance data that included a demographic profile for each of the subpopulations, uh, as well as a local survey that was done um, on health and social determinants within the subpopulations that was translated in, among uh, seven languages and instituted in a variety of settings, including businesses, community-based organizations, libraries, festivals, um, universities, religious organizations. We had about 2,500 adults participate in the survey in, in 2017. And um, by, by November of 2017, that assessment was completed that included uh, the demographic profiles, the secondary surveillance data, and the summary of the survey data that was approved by the board in November of 2017. 
You can go to the next slide. This is just a, a, a picture of what the report looked like in 2017. And there was just some common themes that I want to highlight because these come up um, later. Cancer and heart disease, of course, were um, the top two leading causes of diseases, but there were some other themes that I think are worth noting. Um, senior poverty, as I mentioned, um, was highlighted, as well as tuberculosis, liver cancer, mental health um, were also identified as other areas concerned. And of particular note, there was um, significant burden of adverse health outcomes among Vietnamese, Filipino, and Pacific Islander communities. And the last thing I want to point out is that there were some overlapping key areas, which included tuberculosis, again, seniors, language barriers, mental health, and suicide. So if we move forward, uh, we went to phase two. In phase two, uh, we felt like we needed to do some more work. So the public health department um, collaborated with Aki, Asian American for Community Involvement, and really launched uh, the second phase of this study, was really to en engage community stakeholders from each of the seven API uh, subgroups to review the data, to obtain input on priorities and inform the development of an implementation plan. And I want to highlight one of the important factors, as you know, public health department does many health assessments um, that is really centered on data. But the actions related to those assessments really belong to the community. And it's really important that the community um, lead the direction of those priorities and lead the implementation of those priorities. And so during this phase, um, I just wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about what happened in this phase. Um, Asian American for Community Involvement uh, took the lead and convened a series of focus groups in the community amongst each of the seven uh, populations and summarized those, um, those focus groups, which, which in the report called the Asian and Pacific Islander Health Assessment Priorities and Recommendation. And you can go to the next slide and there's a photo of that report that came out in 2018. And in that report, there were some common themes and overlapping uh, priorities that were established, which included a focus on chronic disease, a real need in the community to address chronic disease, access to healthcare and healthcare utilization, a need to really figure out uh, what we could do collectively related to intimate partner violence, mental health, and the needs of seniors. So I wanted to say, um, in the spirit of the community really owning uh, the, the implementation and priorities of the assessment plan, there's been several organizations who have taken some of these recommendations and have implemented them, as well as some departments within the county. And I'm just going to give you a, just a snippet highlight of what some of those examples were. But I wanted to emphasize that Asian American for Community Involvement has played a very significant role in the implementation planning, um, the assessment planning, and actually um, delivering some of the services that relate to the Asian health assessment, Asian and Pacific Islander health assessment. The public health department has done some, has some programmatic areas that are in line with the recommendation of the assessment. The health trust has played a very significant role in really um, um, translating and amending, adapting um, evidence-based practices related to chronic disease, um, particularly focused on the API community. And the Office of Gender-Based Violence has identified intimate partner violence as a priority and has partnered with the community on several initiatives in that area. Behavioral Health Services, particularly in their Family and Youth Services Division, and many, many others. So I'm going to give you just a snippet of an update um, as the last part of this presentation. So one of the first things uh, we did with Asian for American for Community Involvement is we had a community meeting in April 18th, where we had over 60 people represented in the community to participate in it. Um, the purpose was to present the results of the Asian um, Pacific Islander Health Assessment Priorities and Recommendation and have the community help us identify some service gaps and identify uh, key community partners who might want to adopt some of those priority areas and lead in those areas. Next slide. Um, one of those, uh, some of those key priorities were a community health worker program, culturally appropriate outreach services, 
mental health services, seniors, and intimate partner violence. You'll notice in the ledge file that there's a reference um, and an attachment that is the Asian and Pacific Islander Health Assessment Priority Area Matrix. Um, that's an attachment. And that is the summary of the report from that community meeting, which highlighted the priority areas and which community-based organization might be appropriate to lead in some of those priority areas. So I just wanted to highlight that for you today. So moving through some of these examples, uh, I'll start first with the API community health worker model. I know you wanna talk about that more. I wanna start with this and give you some other examples and then I'll close. So this was one of the strategies that was identified as a priority at the community meeting in April of 2019 and also a strategy in the implementation plan um, that was completed by Asian American for Community Involvement. This model um, is a strategy to establish a, a growing workforce, um, a growing workforce of trusted community members to address the health disparities, barriers, and system gaps identified in the API subcommunities. The model was created, um, Supervisor Joseph, Joseph Simidian, you did a referral to public health department um, as an outcome of that April 2019 meeting and asked us to come back with a recommended model um, that was in line with the spirit and the goals of the Asian Health Assessment Implementation Plan and the priorities. And so in that plan, uh, that, that the community identified that there were several barriers to implementing a community health worker model. There was a lack of sustainable funding, a lack of capacity within agencies to oversee the community health workers, and a lack of training regarding the intersectional population focus. So the model that we proposed really addressed some of these community identified barriers. Um, it had a, a strategy for sustainable funding. It had a strategy uh, based on community action planning and really addressing the, the priorities that were established by the different subgroups, which included healthcare access, chronic disease, intimate partner violence, behavioral health, and COVID-19. It included processes that were culturally tailored to each the to meet the uh, needs of each subgroup area. And it really built in a capacity to build a workforce of community health workers over time that, that would be very specific and provide the linguistic and cultural specificity needed in the community. This, this model was approved by the Board of Supervisors in July of 2020 for one year funding for uh, $400,000. We can go to the next slide. Another, uh, Activity that's happening related to the priorities um, of the API um, implementation plan is aging Alzheimer's and other related diseases. The public health department was one of six agencies statewide that received the, Healthy health, the California Healthy Brain Initiative grant this year. Um, this grant has two uh, ethnic priorities, one for African African ancestry and another for Asian and Pacific Islander who account for 18% of the dementia deaths um, in this county. So um, our main partner for this work um, currently is Alzheimer's Association, as well as many other community-based organizations with a focus to provide brain health and cognitive decline risk reduction education and support for caregivers within the Chinese and the Vietnamese community. Next slide. Intimate partner violence was another priority ident identified. I wanted to highlight that the Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention has partnered with several community-based organizations on prevention and intervention programs that are accessible to the local API community. They have awarded $1.5 million to trusted API serving community-based organizations for culturally responsive and community-based prevention intervention services. Uh, they also support, support local domestic violence agencies that provide emergency or transitional housing survivors. Um, and here's some examples there. We're hoping that uh, the community health worker model will also be able to partner with the Office of Gender-Based Violence. And then I just think that there's two more. One is behavioral health, family and children's division, their step care approach to behavioral health services. Uh, their REACH program provides uh, presentations to the API faith-based organizations, organ faith-based and community-based organizations to provide aware awareness on high-risk psychosis. 
They also have the uh, AA, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Perspective on Mental Health and Wellness Program, which is really focused on the Santa Clara Office of Education and the Asian and Pacific Islander Educations Network. They provide information on the on the prevalence of mental health within the API community and also um, information on just dispelling the myths and stigma associated with uh, mental health within uh, the school systems. And then lastly, um, outpatient services and there's contracts with several community-based organizations that are providing uh, behavioral health services focused on um, Asian and Pacific Islander. And then last is uh, the work that um, the Health Trust has done. The Health Trust uh, received funding from the county immediately after the initial passing of the Asian and Pacific Islander Health Assessment to really uh, move forward evidence-based practices focused on chronic conditions. So they've translated materials, uh, uh, chronic conditions materials into Mandarin and Vietnamese. They've built capacity and trained uh, several leaders in the community to implement these curriculum in their specific languages. And then they have also uh, specifically implemented various um, programs focused on chronic disease uh, management and, and chronic disease prevention services to over 2,400 residents in the community. I think that's the last slide. Yeah, I think that's the last slide. So I just wanted to give you a sample of the work that um, some community-based organization leaders have done in this area, as well as some of the departments in the county. And um, again, we really like to have um, health assessments become live documents and really have the community take those priorities and recommendations and move those forward. So um, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Ms. McClinton Brown. Uh, covered a lot of ground uh, very expeditiously. Uh, and I would just underscore your very last comment, which is the importance of <clears throat> uh, making these, in your phrase, living documents, uh, uh, the exhortation when this was introduced way back in 2016 was to make sure that it wasn't just an academic exercise or an intellectual exercise, but one that we could really use to go out and do the work. Um, Supervisor Lee, I got a couple of quick questions and then I'll defer to you if you're okay with that order. Um, thank you. Uh, Ms. McClendon-Brown, I, as I mentioned, I, the, the health worker program uh, is, uh, was a follow-up uh, to this, in, in fact, an effort to make this a living document to, to then go do the work once we had identified the best uh, strategies to address the various needs. What's the current timing on that? At one point I had, my expectation was that we were gonna try and sign a contract by the end of calendar year 20 so that we could roll into 21. Um, that obviously hasn't happened. So where are we in that process? Thanks for asking. Yes, that was our goal. Um, and we are definitely a little bit behind our goal, um, but we are getting there. So the there is a contract in process. Um, it is scheduled to be placed on the board agenda for March 23rd uh, for your approval. Thank you. And um, let me just ask, uh, we had, if I recall correctly, budgeted, I think the $400,000 for this fiscal year, we're getting a late start. Um, so Dr. Smith, does that mean that the funds that are unused for this year will roll over to next year and be supplemented to the extent that it, it's necessary to make the program uh, function for fiscal year 22, 21-22? Yes, and uh, we might do that one of two ways I'm more comfortable right now putting it into the base so that it keeps on going every year. Um, we could just roll it over and add money one time money, but that is uh, sending the wrong message. So we'll likely put it into the base. Either Thank way, you. it's going to continue. Thank you. And let me ask both of you, if I may, Dr. Smith and Ms. McClinton Brown, the, 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 the expectation was that there would be, if I remember correctly, and Ms. McClendon-Brown helped me with my memory here because it's been a while, 
but my my recollection is that that we were going to sort of see this as the first phase with the um, health health worker program targeting a limited number of the seven communities you identified, but that once we had um, let that run its course through the end of this fiscal year, we were going to try and get to the wider array, I believe all seven of the identified sub communities. Am I remembering that right? You're remembering that right. And thank you for reminding me. I, I forgot to mention that in my in my um, description of the community health worker program. So that is the plan. Um, we will initially start with uh, three of the populations. And I think if you recall, um, when we heard this item at the board meeting, we were also um, deep, deep, deep in the COVID period. And so, you know, given the devastated impact of COVID-19 pandemic, um, we, we are going to start with the populations, the subpopulations that have been most disproportionately impacted by COVID and utilize uh, this COVID period kind of as a training ground to get the skills up, to get people going. And then, and then once they're up and going, then they can expand their role to those topic areas that we described earlier in the, in the presentation. And once we have the first cohort trained and moving forward, then we could then think about now expanding it to the other subpopulations. Yes, you're correct. Does that mean that what I'll call phase two is delayed by at least nine months from when we had this initial conversation back in July last year? Another nine months. In other words, that that we're 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 going to have to run through the phase one exercise uh, now nine months later before we can get to phase two. That's correct. And does that mean that won't happen in the coming fiscal year? In the in the coming fiscal year, meaning between between now and and June, or are you talking about between July? 2021. Thanks. I we always stumble over communication. I know. <laughs> July, it's between July 1st of 2021 and June uh, of 2022. So that's our coming fiscal year. You know, my concern is that puts us two years out from the initial action, which uh, you remind us is uh, was taken in July of 2020 without any opportunity to move into the second phase that's a yeah you know i i actually would like to defer the answer to that question if it's okay to you because i think it's a very very good question to have with the lead organization once the lead organization gets up and running i think it's a fair question um to ask about you know how how, how do we begin to uh, mobilize and to start planning for the next phase um I, I think if, if you're okay, I would like to come back with an answer to that question because I don't I don't think that I have the answer to that question today. Let me uh, well let me say I'm always delighted when people say let's go ask folks what's really going to work. So thank you for that. Uh, I guess the question is when do you think you might be able to come back with that information? And Ms. McClinton Brown, I, I'm, if it seems like I'm trying to put you on the spot, it's because I am. But part of the reason I'm trying to put you on the spot is. Um, as Dr. Smith knows all too well, you know, if we get past that June budget process, uh, all of a sudden it's a year before um, we uh, are back at the at the budget, uh, unless we sort of make a determination that we want to use the mid-year budget process in January. So I'm I'm just trying to see if I can't pull this information together sooner rather than later, so that we don't lose literally a whole year by virtue of missing the, the budget cycle. Maybe I can jump in on that, uh, Supervisor, if you don't mind. Thank you, please. Um, when the uh, board approves the uh, contract on the 23rd, um, we'll be um, moving ahead as fast as we possibly can and come back into the uh, subcommittee, I would suggest uh, immediately after that with the contractor to uh, give a better flow of how we would actually envision melding phase one and phase two together so that we don't have this uh, either or approach. Um, and I would anticipate that we'll have enough uh, resources recommended in the 
um, 21, 22 budget to be able to carry us through uh, the beginning of phase, what used to be called phase two, which we'll say now is a melding of phase one and phase two. And since we'll put it into the base budget, um, if we need to augment it because of expenditures, we'll augment it in the mid-year for next year. So we'll make sure that we don't get ourselves tripped up in budget cycles and we don't get limited by phasing either. Thank you. I think both uh, you and um, Ms. McClinton, Ms. excuse me, McClinton, um, uh, and, 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 and Ms. McClinton Brown and I have known each other for 20 plus years. If I, if I say McClintock, forgive me, I had a colleague, uh, Senator McClintock, when I was in the state Senate, you, you, uh, you have precious little in common with him. I'll, I'll, I'll just put it that way, Ms. McClinton Brown. Um, so it happens. Forgive, <laughs> forgive me. Um, uh, I think you're both doing a, a very good job, uh, though, of uh, making the case that on the one hand, we need to make sure we learn how to walk before we run with the program. That being said, acknowledging that, you know, we don't want to be sort of in a place where we're ready to move on to do even more, uh, hopefully to achieve, you know, greater good uh, and stymied simply by the calendar. So uh, thank you for um uh for that uh i think um i think then dr smith if i understood you correctly what that means is we could take action on the contract in, in march um and uh then revisit this issue perhaps after having worked a little with the contractor uh in either april or may was that your thinking that was what I was thinking, uh, okay. just so that we get, we have to get all the parties in front of you, I think, to give a better idea of exact timing um, so that you'll be able to give us direction about how to proceed. However, I'm presuming, I think with good evidence, that um, the community worker program is going to be a very positive addition to our services and we will continue to provide it it's not going to be a time limited service thank you all right well then i think i'm going to work on the assumption uh dr smith and Ms. McClinton brown that uh we will uh have the contract before us on the 23rd and then come back uh in april or may uh as timing permits uh but that at least gets us into the conversation before we uh, close out the, the budget in June and also allows us for to, to sort of lay out a, a budget path to the extent that we think we know what the future looks like. And Ms. McClinton, Ron, you made passing reference to it and I so appreciated it. Um, I, I did make the observation when we had the conversation last uh, that um, it seemed to me that if ever there was a time when it it could and would be helpful to roll out a program like this, it's in the midst of a pandemic. So. Um, I, I think it is, uh, if, ever, if it ever was needed, now now is the time. I'm going to let it go uh, there, go to uh, Supervisor Lee, see if he's got comments or, well, I take that back. I have one just technical question about the slides, and uh, because it was of interest uh, and note to me, if I look at the demographics page, which is the sort of maybe third or fourth page in on the uh, presentation, and if uh, if we can ask Dr. Smith to uh, prove his versatility again by putting the page up on the screen. This is the demographics page, Dr. Smith, if you can. Mr. Chair, if Dr. Smith has stepped away, we can, oh, okay, we got it, there thank you. you. Well, well done, thank you. I, I know everybody's doing the best they can under challenging circumstances here. Ms. McClinton Brown, this, um, if I'm reading the chart correctly, and I think I am, it says, so we're, we're talking about the percentage of the population that was, that is, is not, that was born outside the U.S. So, you know, I think it, it's 
fairly well known within our county circles in terms of the services we provide that as the bar on the right indicates, 38% of the county population uh, is uh, foreign born, born outside the United States. Um, I, uh, I know that is a number that surprises a lot of folks when I share it with them, but certainly at the county, we're mindful of that in terms of uh, just who we serve. If I read this correctly, though, what you're telling us with that next uh, chart bar that says 67 above it is that 67 percent, more than two thirds of the uh, entire Asian Pacific uh, Islander population in the county is foreign born. Yes. I'm yeah, sorry, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Uh, Ms. McLean Brown. I'm so sorry. So sorry about that. Yeah, that's correct. At the time of this census data, the period between 2011 and 2015, uh, two in three uh, members of the API community were born, um, were foreign born. Um, okay. And, and, and the highest percentage of that was among the Asian Indian population. As compared or contrasted, moving to the right on your graph. Uh, or on your chart, rather, um, where the Japanese population is 41%, suggesting that uh, that uh, community has been part of the what, uh, Santa Clara County population for a longer period of time, and that we have uh, a, a very, okay. I think, um, and then the Pacific Islander uh, number is even uh, appreciably lower. I, I think this is, um, this is one of those that it's easy to sort of flip past as you're trying to make sure you stay within your 15 minutes. Yes. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's important sort of to, to give some thought to in terms of what are the implications of this. And from a public health standpoint, you know, if, you know, uh, two thirds on average, and in some cases, you know, almost three quarters of a particular population has an experience receiving health care outside of the American system, that's that's going to mean that some, I mean, we, we use the term cultural competency quite frequently at the county, but it seems to me it's sort of very real and immediate when you're, you're looking at these numbers in terms of what we need to bring to bear uh, if we're going to serve people well. So I'll say thank you for that. Thank you for the clarification. And I'll turn to my colleague the very patient Supervisor Otto Lee and see if he's got comments or questions at this time. Supervisor. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. McClendon Brown. Um, the question I have is regarding more on the um, program, uh, as, as mentioned, regarding the uh, um, API uh, um, community health worker model. Um, you mentioned that this was approved back in July 2020 for the $400,000. And um, I guess due to COVID, things were delayed, but uh, in any case, so there's now a contract in process with the March 23rd date for approval. So at this point, there's already a uh, potential lead agency to implement this program, am I correct? There, There is a potential lead agency that's been identified, correct? Okay, good. Um, I, I guess what I'm, I'm concerned in moving forward uh, is to make sure that, uh, that uh, we get a report on this update because obviously the the health uh, worker model is something that we are very concerned about. Uh, do you think this is something that could come back to us on a monthly basis uh, to this committee uh, when, after the March twenty third date once it's being uh, uh, adopted? Sure, if that's if that's what you need, I'm happy to do that. Okay, that's great. Yes, uh, and you mentioned that the um, base you will be using the desegregated desegregated data to do the outreach based on the needs like in COVID, for example. And as we have seen, uh, as much as the Asian community comparing to Latinx community and African American community has been doing better in terms of numbers, but once you desegregate it, it turns out the Vietnamese community, for example, uh, has the, the worst numbers. So I would imagine that means that the idea is we will be uh, attacking uh, this issue with the Vietnamese American community first. Uh, due to that that uh, disparity, am I correct? Yeah, Dr. Smith and Dr. Cody can speak to this probably more specifically than I can, but but from my knowledge, uh, Vietnamese populations and Filipino uh, populations mm -hmm. have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. Right, right. 
Okay. And, that's and just so that I'm clear of your request, are you requesting that we come back monthly to the Health and Hospital Committee to report on the API Community Health Worker Program or this broader report that we're doing today on the HR? Well, the, the, the health worker model, I just want to okay. make sure that uh, okay. that's, you know, okay. one thing I want to kind of see how it's going and hopefully that it is really reaching out to the different communities that, that uh, they so need, so need the, these, uh, these services right this time. Okay. And Super, Supervisor Lee, I wanted to ask, excuse the interruption, I wanted to ask if it would be agreeable to you that such a uh, monthly report back uh, might be placed on consent if things appear to be going smoothly, but that could be heard. I, I ask that tentatively because I'm the one who's now got three items on monthly reports. So I, I, if you if you said you, you wanted to hear it uh, fully, I would certainly understand and respect that. But I just wanted to clarify that if things are on a good track, you're happy to uh, let it stay on consent unless there's uh, work to be done or conversation to be had. Did I read that right, or did I put words in your mouth you didn't want me to, Supervisor? That's fine. I think uh, being, I, I, I think it's be good to just uh, have some uh, uh, report back so that we are making sure that this model is, if it's running into problems, we should know about earlier. But being consensual, we're fine. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, Supervisor? Yeah, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Then. Um, uh, let's uh, see if we have members of the public who are here to speak on this item. Let me turn to the clerk. We currently have four speakers, sir. All right, then uh, let's uh, welcome those four speakers uh, and provide each of them with up to two minutes for their comments. Thank you and welcome, folks. Folks. Thank you. Our first speaker is Michelle Liu. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Supervisor Simidian and Lee. I'm Michelle Liu, CEO of the Health Trust. I wanna thank you for your strong support of the Asian Health Assessment and the related health services. Supervisor Simidian, I remember your exhortation back in 2016 about making the assessment a living document. And I'm pleased to note, as Rhonda mentioned, the Health Trust built off the county's Asian Health Assessment to develop culturally appropriate federally approved chronic disease education programs reaching more than 2,400 county residents. Thanks to your support, health education materials are now translated into Asian languages. A cadre of bilingual community members are now certified health education trainers. And so please rest assured that your initial investment will pay dividends in the many years to come especially now with the pandemic and the current increase in anti-Asian violence, now is really an opportune time for the county to prioritize health support for Asian residents. We encourage you to continue to disaggregate Asian data and champion culturally appropriate health services for residents. And we look forward to continued partnership with you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wesley Mukayama. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Wes, if you could unmute, please. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mrs. McClinton Brown for the presentation. However, I, I do question some of the uh, data that you have. In, in, in the data that I have been involved in the Asian community for decades, and uh, I, I, I have learned that we're 38% of the county's population, being the only county in the state of California that is a majority already, and we are also the, probably the only county in the whole United States. Uh, with this majority. And I think we need to look at that even closer. We are also the most bullied population in the schools. Asian Americans are, are, are the most bullied population in the schools. Um, that's another situation. And I question the Japanese uh, foreign born 41% of the population. That, that I, I, I'm sure is not, not accurate. Um, and due to COVID, we've had almost 4,000 assaults 
in the United States and quite a few here. And why that isn't on your problem list, I don't know. I think we need really, we really need to look at that. And uh, having lived in the South Pacific for six years in Samoa and, and Solomon Islands, uh, that number is small because many of the uh, Asian uh, Pacific Islanders are from are from Hawaii and other countries, which does, is not considered a foreign country. So I think uh, that situation they uh, is different as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Rogers. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, this is Mike Rogers. I wanted to first of all commend uh, the staff on this re excellent report, um, but I also wanted to go back to Dr. Ken Horwich's pitch for the uh, Health Advisory Commission and uh, their focus in uh, increasing on functional medicine as a means to fundamentally address the root causes of chronic diseases. When we look at chronic disease, depending on your source, whether it's AMA or other assessors um, or consultants, it's two thirds to uh, four fifths of the cost of medicine in this country. And um, even in the report, there are tie-ins here of things like a high rate of uh, uh, liver cancer, for example, is an end state of metabolic disease, uh, fatty liver disease, which runs predominantly higher uh, in these communities that are lesser served, and especially with Hispanics, for example, who have at least a couple of genetic predispositions to that uh, condition. Um, but uh, again, uh, I would like to pitch for more fundamental approaches. I'd love to see this kind of work. It's, it's great in thinking about how do we pivot from the increased uh, interaction with the county, with all the staff that have been involved with COVID to pivoting to being a more proactive based engagement with community organizations in all of these diverse communities in the lesser served parts of the county seems to be a, a no brainer and it's more of what makes sense and how do we do it. Uh, a couple of useful constructs are, there are a lot of tools and capabilities that are certified available off the shelf to provide core assessments for behavioral health, the social determinants of health that are highly reimbursable by the deeper pockets of the state Medicaid and federal CMS Medicare programs. So uh, great work and I really wanna see how this pans out. And again, a plug for the uh, advisory uh, commission, which is coming up this evening to look at a more fundamental approaches. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarita Coley. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Supervisors um, Lee and, and uh, Samidian. Uh, I'm very excited to, to see this uh, project moving along. Uh, thank you, Supervisors Samidian, for championing the Asian Health Assessment in the first place. Uh, it has been a while. And I do recall you saying back then also that it should be a living document. You didn't want to see it in a folder somewhere gathering dust. Um, so I'm very happy to see um, that it's actually coming to fruition at this point in time. Um, and uh, over the past couple of years, all the sessions that have happened with the, community, with the community partners, as well as with the public health department to identify the issues that are um, uh, significant for different uh, subgroups of the Asian population. Um, and I would agree with my previous speaker here and my previous CEO, Michelle, um, disaggregating that data is really, really important because um, as you very rightly pointed out, Supervisor Samidian, uh, looking at the numbers of that slide that you had Rhonda pull up again, it really points to how important it is to tailor your interventions to specific cultures and languages and to make sure that you're reaching the communities. So I, I think the community health worker model will be um, an excellent way to, uh, because the community workers are from the, from the populations themselves, um, they are trusted. And particularly at this time during the pandemic, um, there's a lot of mistrust out there and we really need to have people from the communities connect with the communities um, so that they can get the right uh, information and have faith that they're getting the right information. So appreciate the opportunity um, to speak today and uh, thank you so much for championing um, the, the, this particular in initiative. That concludes our speakers, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Madam Clerk, and thank you to all of the folks who took time to speak. Uh, let me just indicate uh, for uh, my office uh, that I would like to uh, sort of follow up a little on um, looking at the data in a more refined way. I know that work has already been done, Ms. McClendon-Brown, and uh, we'll also do a little fact-checking with you on some of the issues that were raised. It's why I went out of my way to make sure I was um, applying the right frame to the numbers that you provided, I, I, I think. Um, but we'll, we'll follow up with you offline on that. Don't need to take more time today. And then um, if Supervisor Lee is prepared to uh, move receipt of the report, but uh, with direction that the um, health worker item come back to our committee in April or May and or in May with uh, a, a specific uh, direction to identify how we blend phase one and blaze phase two in a timely fashion and that there simply be a monthly report to the committee for the committee's consideration, which was Supervisor Lee's specific request. I would be pleased to entertain and second such a motion, Supervisor. Yes, definitely so moved on this uh, motion and it's something that has been uh, awesome work uh, from the different community members like the Health Trust and Aki, uh, who we of course know so well in the community of the great work. Uh, I just do want to make one uh, quick comment. Um, uh, uh, so by, uh, Chair uh, Sminian, is that the segregation of data uh, is something that is absolutely crucial for us to understand what's going on. Uh, for example, when we look at the COVID data, when they said, that, oh, gee, the Asian communities are doing so well compared to the other communities, without the desegregated data, we wouldn't have known that the Filipino Americans or the Vietnamese Americans are the ones that's actually completely uh, affected far more than the other groups. So I think it is so important to have those data available, even though I have heard that there are groups that are fighting uh, to not allow the data to be segregated. I think this is uh, something that is really important and I'm very glad that our county is doing this. So I just want to make that uh, point uh, and highlight that important issue. And, and thank you very much, Rhonda, for the great report and the great work you've done on this. Thank you. All right. We have a motion by uh, Lee and a second by Simidian. And we ask the clerk to call the roll and I'll add my thanks uh, to that of Supervisor Lee. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thanks again, uh, Ms. McClinton Brown and uh, folks at Public Health. Appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Smith, thanks for weighing in to provide a little clarity on how we can chart a smooth path from phase one to phase two and do it all in a timely and uh, fashion. All right, I think that takes us on our revised schedule to item number 10, which is to <laughs> receive the report from the care relating to protective services provided within the health and hospital system. And um, Dr. Smith and uh, Mr. Lorenz, uh, and I'm sure uh, Supervisor Lee is uh, ahead of me on this one, uh, we, you know, we want to take this report initially from the office of the sheriff, but it's obviously a, a topic that is uh, goes beyond just the sheriff's office in terms of uh, how we ensure the safety and well-being, uh, not only of the public, but in this instance, quite specifically, our employees as well. So, uh, let me turn to the sheriff's office and say, welcome. What would you like to share with us? Um, we do have any. Um, we're available for any questions you may have, supervisor. Um, and we don't really have any comments, but any questions would be fine. And we sure appreciate what the nurses do. And we know it's a very difficult a job. And, you know, we're there as part of the team with them. All right. Dr. Smith, um, how would you like to have the rest of the organization weigh in on this topic? It is um, one where, uh, you know, we have a range of folks, I'm thinking of the uh, the PSOs, the public service officers as well, uh, who are involved. Um, thoughts about the issue overall, would, you, would, uh, would it be helpful if we heard from members of the public and or our employees who may be queued up uh, before providing uh, your observations? What's your, what's your thinking on this one? Probably best to hear from the public first, then I do have some observations for you and a little bit of 
history and tell you what we have in plan at this point. Okay. Well, thank you. We do have a two page report from the sheriff's office for those of you who have not yet seen it. Uh, and uh, item number 10, why don't we ask the clerk to help us identify folks who may be waiting to speak? How many do we have, Madam Clerk? We currently have one speaker. All right. Well, let's hear from that one. And if there's another, uh, we'll hear from uh, them as well. Thank you. Our first speaker is Alan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Alan? Alan, you're unmuted. Go ahead. We'll come back to Alan, sir. Our next speaker is Wesley Mukoyama. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Sheriff Smith. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking a question that maybe I should have talked to you earlier about, but um, we were involved in the selection of the uh, uh, behavioral health or going out on calls uh, uh, officer that was uh, up for application. We, we, we uh, myself and the uh, chair of the behavioral health board interviewed it and there was a unanimous decision uh, of our uh, uh, choosing I forgot his name. She was a woman, and and we found out later that she wasn't selected. So I'm um, a little disappointed about that because she had by far the best uh, qualifications in the group. I don't know if she left or whatever, but I think uh, it's important that we uh, kind of uh, look into uh, the selections uh, in terms of. Uh, we we do we do have a strong feeling for who might be selected in the sheriff's office when they go out having having been you know a chaplain in the jail for 12 years i i'm i'm very interested in how how things were there that's my question all right thank you uh mr mukiyama i'm going to suggest that that's a question that might be best resolved offline so if that's a conversation between the sheriff's department and Mr. Mukiyama will uh, let them have that conversation offline. Let me go back to the clerk though and see if we can get our uh, our other speaker uh, in into the system uh, somehow. Alan, let's try one more time. You have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. All right. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Please go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, supervisor. This is Alan Kamara, um, president of the Registered Nurses Professional Association. Thank you, uh, supervisors, for taking this on, and thank you, Sheriff Smith. Thanks to Paul Lorenz, and thanks to Dr. Smith as well. The concern that we have here is we want to make a disclaimer so you know, as nurses, first and foremost, we, we have tremendous respect for our patient and we don't want anybody to uh, violate our patient's right. Um, but it becomes an issue to us. Just imagine when one of you happens to be at work and your colleague is being assaulted and they end up getting um, a life-changing surgery. And that's what's happening within our system where our nurses are being assaulted and we don't have any way to protect them. Um, it's been two years, for example, where St. Louis and O'Connor were acquired by the county and the promise that was made to the, to the community is you will treat all as the enterprise and provide security for them as it, it is now. We still have private security officers over at St. Louis and O'Connor. We still don't have good protection for them. And we're wondering why are you going to treat those hospitals like Valley Medical. And as you see, um, we already sent you an email to our position with this um, agenda item from the sheriff's office. So I don't have to talk too much on that. But all we ask you is to make sure all these nurses feel protected. San Luis and O'Connor 
have to have the same protection protection that we have in Bali Medical. And the question to you all is, when are you willing to take that seriously and make sure all our nurses all over the system feel protected like everywhere else, just as you feel protected at work? That concludes our speaker, sir. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Let me go now to Dr. Smith and uh, see if he can offer some overarching comments, and then I'll go to uh, Supervisor Lee, see if he's got comments or questions, and then I'll uh, I'll back clean up. Dr. Smith? Yes, thank you. Um, we've been uh, working on the issue of uh, security for the health system for um, a couple of years at least, um, because we're recognizing um, that different levels of security need to be provided at different parts of the system. Um, there are different um, types of services provided um, with uh, different risk profiles. It's obviously different being um, in uh, the locked psych facility than it is being in a in a uh, open clinic setting, and we have multiple different settings throughout the county. Um, so we have been, before COVID started, in the process of developing alternative classifications for security um, to add to the current options of uh, PSOs and uh, deputies. Uh, we will continue with that process, which got delayed during COVID. And we are in the midst of doing a risk analysis at um, the two new hospitals to determine what type of security is needed in what locations. Um, so it's not a simple answer to the question because different there's different needs in different parts of the system. And we're uh, working on completing the classification change and the risk analysis. All right. Supervisor Lee, comments, questions? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for the um, explanation. Maybe I need a little bit more uh, understanding is you said that there will be a, a risk analysis of the type of of the level of securities uh, that would be needed uh, for those two hospitals and alternative uh, classification change. Um, when do you think this analysis will be completed? I think we'll um, get it completed in the summer, mid-summer, and have recommendations for the board in August to add the classification. Um, the concern, I think, from the nurses, from what I heard from Mr. Cameron, is about the fact that how that the VMC right now, um, we now were able to get the uh, deputy sheriffs um, to support them. Uh, do we currently not have any deputy sheriffs at all uh, over at those two hospitals? No, we currently have uh, private security there. Only, right, but no, no. Right. The deputies, right? That's the, that's right. A concern, right? We've continued with the community hospital model. You know, most hospitals don't have armed guards or armed sheriffs uh, present. Um, it's uh, you know desirable not to have a badge and a gun if we don't need it. Um, and we obviously. Gentlemen, I apologize, Dr. Smith, and I apologize, Supervisor Lee, but I I was under the impression uh, that we, in fact, had a deputy stationed at the emergency department, although somewhat reduced uh, at present, and one that is sort of uh, on patrol, trolling the campus. Uh, I, I, am I under a misimpression? No, I think you're under the right impression. I meant we don't have a, you know, stationed... We don't have a station deputy like we do at VMC. We have numerous deputies at VMC. We have partial coverage. All right. Supervisor Lee, I apologize if I interrupt your train of thought. I was trying to be helpful with a clarification. I hope that didn't take you off track. Back well, to yeah, you. Clarification helps. And I did see that uh, 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 Sheriff 
and their staff was nodding during that answer. So maybe I asked the sheriff to uh, to clarify a little bit more. I really appreciate it about the coverage of St. Louis and uh, and uh, O'Connor. Thank you. Sure. Let's go to Sheriff Smith and her team. Uh, yes. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and unmute? Oh, I have unmuted. It's good. Okay. Um, we do have deputies assigned to Valley Medical Center, but not O'Connor and St. Louis, which I think was what the question Supervisor Lee was asking. And we, we do have that. It's been tremendously beneficial. We also have management staff from the Sheriff's Office over the public safety officers that, it, that are at um, all facilities. Oh, thank you, Sheriff. That, that's helpful. Yep. And... Um... Now the area that's being covered over in, you know, uh, where O'Connor in St. Louis is, uh, that's certainly still within the patrol area of our um, airport. Um, do you don't have any, uh, you view anybody assigned there, do you have people you know, drive by from time to time or can respond uh, if needed at this point? Um, so both of the other hospitals are not in our jurisdiction, but we do have like um, O'Connor is pretty close to our Burbank area, but, right. but we don't provide um, services there because it's not our jurisdiction. But it's certainly something we could do if we had staff assigned there. Right. Okay. Good. That, that's uh, that's what I need to know. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sheriff. And then that's a question I have, uh, Chair. Thank you, um, Doctor Smith. I wonder uh, if I were to ask. Supervisor Lee for a motion to receive the report, but with the direction or also and with the direction to uh, provide an off agenda timeline in writing uh, that essentially reduces to writing the timeline you described in terms of uh, reaching some conclusion and bringing this back uh, to our board or to the committee or to take whatever administrative action. I think um, I, I share Supervisor Lee's concern about sort of bringing this um, process to a, a, a meaningful conclusion on a timely basis. I want to eliminate or mitigate risk as, as fully, but also as quickly as we possibly can in all these venues. And so, uh, Supervisor Lee, are you prepared to offer such a motion at this time? Uh, yes, I am, and I would actually add a point is that there's any way we could uh, actually expedite the analysis and so we need to the summer to get it completed basically as soon as possible in order to provide the, the soonest coverage of, of security to our nurses, especially in this time of COVID, I think would be necessary. Thank you. All right. I'm going to call that a motion. I'm going to offer a second. I'm going to turn to Dr. Smith. Uh, whose uh, microphone light is popping on and off and give him uh, an opportunity to uh, clarify if he would like uh, or comment if he would like. Dr. Smith? Sure, we'll come back uh, with a written off agenda report. Um, it will have more than what I just said because the issue is more complex, but we'll put it all in there and have it available for you and the public. Thank you, and and I know Supervisor Lee knows this, but for members of the public who may be listening or interested, uh, and certainly for employees who may be listening or interested, uh, the a reminder that these off agenda reports are public documents and readily accessible. Uh, so um, I think if we can get that reduced to writing, uh, it, it just will keep all of us a little more accountable in terms of a, a timely and successful outcome. All right. Um, then uh, we'll ask the clerk to call the roll on that item. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. That motion carries uh, unanimously. All right. We have taken uh, 6, 8, and 10 uh, on a somewhat uh, unusual order today. Uh, and thank everybody for accommodating. That means we are now back to item number seven, which would be to receive the report uh, relating to COVID-19 uh, with a particular emphasis today on vaccination efforts. Thank you, Chairperson Simidian and Supervisor Lee. I'm gonna ask Dr. Smith as always uh, to bring up the slides and run the slides. Um, 
Today, what I will do is just briefly touch on the epi trends so you all know where we are in this pandemic, and then talk a little bit about the rollout of COVID-19 vaccine, and then perhaps we can all uh, discuss together uh, what's, what's next. Um, you can skip the first slide and just go to our epidemic curve. So this is um, uh, has uh, the seven day rolling average of new cases has continued to decline, although a bit more slowly recently. Um, we are right about where we were average number of cases a day in um, early November, just before the case rate started to take off. So I would say we are just now recovering from the fall and winter surge. Next slide. And again, um, the hospitalizations are also continuing to decline, lagging a little bit after the cases. And uh, right now we have around, we still have it today, somewhere between 130, 135 patients in the hospital. And that's where we were in mid-November. Also, if you remember back to last summer, that's about where we were in late August, just to give a feel for where we are. Um, and those, uh, the number of people in the hospital each day does also continue to gradually decline. Uh, so we're holding, holding steady. And the next slide shows the number of deaths per week. The deaths have also declined since the uh, peak uh, of the winter surge. And it's really important to note that the dark blue, which are deaths among long-term care facility residents, um, those have also declined um, and are very, very small in number recently, which is really, really good news um, for all of us. So now in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccine rollout, where we continue to have challenges. Um, uh, the, the news that's not really news to anyone is that our vaccine supply continues to be well below what the demand is and what our capacity is to deliver vaccines. And so essentially what's happening is most of the capacity that we have, we need to uh, for second dose um, obligations such that we have very, very few first dose appointments available. In addition, we continue to have ongoing concerns uh, regarding Blue Shield's role and timing, uh, which I'm sure Dr. Smith uh, can talk more about. Um, and as you know, uh, the state's plan uh, for, for equity in vaccine, vaccine rollout looks at zip codes rather, sense, rather than census tracts, um, allocating 40% of vaccine to the zip codes in the most disadvantaged communities. And what that has ended up doing is meaning that very few zip codes in the Bay Area have had this extra allocation and none of the Santa Clara County zip codes are included in this extra allocation. Um, and so the, the net result is that our efforts in Santa Clara County uh, for equity to ensure that our hardest hit communities um, have rapid and easy access to vaccine um, has been jeopardized uh, because we simply don't have the vaccine supply um, that we need. Before, next slide, we turn to the um, recent allocations. I just wanted to note that the eligibility, uh, uh, who's eligible continues to expand. And as of Monday, eligibility expanded to um, adults age 16 to 64 with high risk conditions. And those high risk conditions are defined on the slide. Um, there's still a number of questions about this. For example, you can see type two diabetes with a particular lab value above seven and a half percent, but type one diabetes uh, is not on here. We get questions about that. We get many, many different questions. Um, also regarding a question about how would a vaccine provider know whether someone was eligible because of these high risk conditions, the, um, the practice um, across the state is generally that 
you rely, if the, if the vaccine is given um, uh, not within someone's medical home, then you rely on the patient um, attestation uh, that they have one of these high-risk conditions. So now just to step back as far as who's eligible, um, remember we started with healthcare workers, then we expanded to all adults um, over 65, then expanded to frontline workers in the categories of food and agriculture, emergency services, and education and child care, um, and now uh, expanding to um, this group of adults with high risk conditions. The next slide uh, shows the allocations of vaccine uh, for the week of March 9th. And as you may remember, the vaccine allocation is a multi-step process where we hear one week what the allocation is, the vaccine arrives the next week. So these are the vaccines um, that, are, that were allocated last week and arrived this week. Um, and what you will see is that while the allocation for the state of California actually was a little bit um, down compared to the week prior, the vaccine allocation in Santa Clara County, and that's the um, ultimately the box in the bottom right, um, our allocation was increased as compared to the week prior. Um, and it did include a few thousand doses of the Johnson or Johnson and Johnson vaccine, the one dose vaccine. Um, but still, even with this, we really just had vaccine to meet the second dose obligation um, and very, very, very little for uh, first dose obligation. Uh, the next slide is a snapshot from our uh, dashboard on vaccination, just to give you a, a, a snapshot uh, of the progress in our county. Um, and the top level message is that nearly a quarter of residents age 16 and older have had at least one dose. Um, there has been some issues with the, uh, the integration of all of the vaccine data at the state level. And so what's on our dashboard right now is a little bit of an underreport of the actual number of residents who have been uh, vaccinated. Uh, next slide. It gives uh, just a bit more detail um, about the status of vaccination um, as of Monday of this week. And the numbers are a little bit different from the slide. I, just, it, it, I know that a lot of folks watch the numbers really closely and they're not exactly, uh, they're, they're a little bit different. But um, I, I think that overall, um, even with the supply that we have, um, we're, we're making steady progress. Um, and uh, the good news is that um, uh, a bit over two thirds of residents uh, 75 and over have received at least one dose and 63% of residents 65 and over have received uh, at least one dose. And you can see there how it breaks out very broadly in the different uh, racial and ethnic groups uh, in our county. Um, uh, with, um, for example, under the 75 and up, 65% um, uh, of Asians have received at least one dose, um, uh, whereas um, uh, Hispanics, 40% uh, have received uh, at least one dose. The next slide shows these trends over time um, among uh, different groups. And the top level message is that a higher proportion of Asian and white 65 or older um, have been vaccinated. Want to anticipate your question about uh, seeing these data by Asian subgroup uh, because they're all linked together. Um, and the, the California Immunization Registry data uh, doesn't collect data by Asian subgroup. It just collects data by this broad category. Um, uh, within our own health and hospital system, I think there's a better chance of seeing those data, um, uh, but we don't have them uh, to share with you today. Uh, next slide shows um, where in our county um, uh, adults 65 and over are being vaccinated. And in general, the trend uh, really since the beginning 
is that a somewhat higher proportion of uh, residents in the West and North County have been vaccinated as compared to other areas uh, in, in the county. And again, this isn't everyone that's been vaccinated. This is just looking at the um, 65 and older trends. The next slide, just to remind you all that we have uh, three different vaccines available, um, the Pfizer and Moderna being the mRNA vaccines that require two different doses and are a little bit more finicky as far as storage and handling. Um, and then the newer one dose uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, that uh, is a little bit more of a traditional vaccine um, and a bit easier for storage and handling. Um, all of them are excellent, excellent vaccines. Um, so all of them provide uh, near complete uh, protection against hospitalization and death from COVID. Also want to note that the circumstances were a little bit different when the vaccines were um, being studied in the clinical trials. And we have a little bit more experience for how the how protective the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is with the new variant circulating. And it looks like um, uh, that, that's actually a real advantage of the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine in that there's um, pretty good protection uh, from the, the uh, South African variant uh, that's emerged um, and that uh, does uh, escape uh, some, other, um, some other vaccines. Uh, the next slide shows where we currently have our county health system vaccine clinics. Um, and I, I just want to sort of note at a high level, if you look in the middle column and see our daily throughput, that's our daily throughput now. It's not our capacity. Um, if we had the vaccine, we do have the capacity at many of these sites to offer far more um, vaccinations each day. I also just want to note that we have worked very hard to have, um, we know that that COVID vaccine, it's not one size fits all. Um, for some people, it's easier, more convenient to go to a setting uh, like a mass vac site um, and just run it through and get it quickly. And for others, they uh, have real challenges accessing the vaccine unless it's right in community uh, where, uh, where people live and work. And so we've try to the very best of our ability to ensure that we have all different types of vaccine uh, to serve the many, many, many different communities that we have here in our county. And the last slide is always just a reminder that all the information one can need around COVID vaccine is at sccfreevax.org, um, including uh, a way to find um, appointments for all currently eligible community members. Um, I am joined here by Dr. Marty Fenstersheib, uh, so we can both um, entertain questions as well as uh, Dr. Smith. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cody et al. And uh, I think uh, Supervisor Lee is uh, still with us, and I want to give him the first opportunity uh, to raise questions because he's dealing with a particularly challenging schedule today. Supervisor Lee, you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, go, right, go right ahead. I understand you may uh, have to drop off uh, some, sometime soon. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cody, for the uh, excellent report, as always, uh, and the uh, excellent work you've been uh, doing with your team uh, to, to provide these accurate information. It's not been uh, easy before the changes with our state um, I myself has uh, uh, helped author a letter to the state of California, to the governor's office, to uh, plead for more vaccines, uh, given the fact that how uh, our county has not been counted as one of the 40, those 40 percent reserved that has the highest level of uh, COVID effect rate. Uh, so far, we have not received any response from the governor's office on that, uh, that request that we provided. Is that correct? I don't think so, Dr. Smith. Do no. Any differently? No, we haven't received any response to that letter at all. Okay. Um, if, if you'd like me to go into more detail in a bit, I will. 
Yeah, I, I think I think that would be helpful, actually, Dr. Smith, because uh, obviously we need the vaccine and we certainly should have qualified for it. So uh, there's more you could uh, talk about how we could uh, get more from from the uh, from from the state. That would be very helpful. Yes. Uh, we're noticing many um, issues all coming in confluence, um, and uh, the state has been relatively quiet. Uh, the one issue that has come up that everybody I think is aware of is the uh, request for the state uh, to enter into a memorandum of understanding with all uh, the counties regarding the third party administrator, which is Blue Shield. I think uh, Santa Clara County and a number of other counties made it clear that the current version of the memorandum of understanding was not acceptable because it precluded the operations uh, the way that we currently do them of uh, sharing vaccine with our community clinic partners. And we think that's a critical, um, critically important issue. Um, the state as of yesterday around 7 p.m. seems to be hearing that message and changing its position. I can't give you exact details because we're still in discussions, but um, I think that the message was heard and they're being going to propose a MOU with more flexibility. I haven't seen it yet, so we'll have to inform you about that when we know more. Regarding the uh, attempts to get a larger allocation, um, we haven't gotten a notification yet of what our allocation is this week. Um, although as uh, Dr. Fensterscheib will tell you in a little bit, it's likely not to be a whole lot different than it was last week. Um, and um, we do, have now access to Tiberius, which is the federal program that measures inventory so that we'll have a better insight into how the state is distributing its vaccine regionally and to uh, MCEs. So um, we're also working, as you know, supervisor, both supervisors on trying to secure commitments in other ways uh, from the federal government, particularly through HRSA, because we have uh, federally qualified health centers and our community partners are also federally qualified health centers. Um, and our um, legislative uh, representatives, uh, Zoe Lofgren and Anna Eshu, have been very instrumental in pushing that issue. And I think that that has uh, been set in a positive uh, direction, although we don't have firm commitments about anything at this point. Um, and then there's also been the concern or attempt to um, connect with uh, the federal pharmacy program. As we know, the feds are making a deal with uh, pharmacies throughout, commercial pharmacies throughout the nation and with uh, mass suppliers of drugs, you know, the so-called uh, quantity buyers. Um, and it looks like we might be able to participate in that. And then finally, there's effort, um, which uh, both supervisors have helped with uh, regarding uh, trying to get a FEMA mm -hmm. supply similar to what's going on in the Oakland Coliseum where their uh, vaccine comes directly from the feds also. So with the help of um, everyone and certainly with the leadership of the Board of Supervisors, each and every one, we're trying every um, avenue we possibly can to get as much vaccine as we can. And I think uh, we're making progress uh, slow and steady. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, that's very helpful. Well, regarding the issue, we talked about the uh, FQHC, the uh, federally qualified health uh, clinic that we have. Um, I read something that uh, that's supposed to start by April or sometime in mid-April, right? We had been on the uh, list and the 
program was spart supposed to start delivering mid-April. Um, we have been able to work with our legislative delegation to try to get um, the implementation date speeded up. Um, we don't obviously have a commitment yet, but discussions are ongoing and that would be helpful. Also, the question becomes, how much vaccine would that be? We don't know the answer to that question yet. Thank you, Dr. Smith. As we all know, the real bottleneck right now is ultimately supply. And I just want to say thank you to uh, your team and along with Dr. Cody and Dr. Fenstersheim for being able to uh, upping our ability to vaccinate like 200,000, right? Per week is the number that we have now. So that's a huge number uh, compared to where we started with in such a short time. So I just say thank you very much. If I could just interrupt for a moment, I, I really want to give a huge resounding shout out to Dr. Jennifer Tong, who is the brilliance and the might uh, behind these amazing operations of the county's um, uh, vaccination clinic operations. Uh, she is a, a gem, a jewel, and the county is lucky, and I just cannot thank her enough. I wanted to say that publicly, and I hope I remember to do it every health and hospital committee. Absolutely. We stole her from Contra Costa. <laughs> thank you. And that's all the questions I have for Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Cody, uh, shout out duly noted, uh, just to uh, affirm that. Um, Dr. Smith and, and or any member of your team that you think uh, can be helpful. I. Um, I was headed to uh, much the same uh, line of questioning uh, that uh, Supervisor Lee pursued uh, around the status of discussions with Blue Shield, the so-called TPA, the third party administrator. Um, it sounds to me like the short version summary of all that is um, problematic as proposed, negotiations remain underway. Is that where we are? Yes, that's pretty much it and some slight evidence that maybe there's understanding on the other side of the table. Okay. And can we um, work on the assumption that while the amounts of vaccine coming each week are insufficient to the need that there will in fact continue to be weekly shipments from the state, and notwithstanding the fact that we've yet to enter into an agreement with their third party administrator, Blue Shield? Yes, I think we can rely upon that. Okay. Uh, and um, let me just uh, shift uh, slightly, uh, and I don't know if this is for you or for legal or for Dr. Cody, but um, can we talk briefly about the potential for moving to the orange tier? Uh, and uh, unless I missed that earlier, I don't think I heard a uh, a prediction or a timeline, but I, that's what I'm looking for if it exists. And uh, also some uh, brief uh, explanation of what that will entail, how life will be different for Santa Clara County residents uh, when that time comes. Thank you, Supervisor Samidian. Uh, this week we did meet the metrics for the state's orange tier and that our adjusted case rate fell below four. Um, since our case rates continue to decline very gradually every day, I anticipate that we will again meet the orange tier metric uh, next Tuesday, which means that we would, if that is the case, we would officially be in the orange tier uh, next Wednesday, so a week from today. Um, the, the, as far as what that means, um, it, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, James Williams always has this ready. Um, uh, more capacity for indoor dining, um, uh, some additional allowances for um, outdoor activities, I think a, even a little bit of activity at amusement parks, etc. cetera. Um, I, as always, um, uh, just urge everyone that just because something is open doesn't mean that it's safe or necessarily a good idea. Um, and I, we still are in a race between the emergence of some uh, new variants 
um, and our ability to vaccinate. And as you know, we stand ready to go really fast with vaccine and we can't. Um, and so we need to still be quite cautious uh, with all of the um, all of the other things that, that we do, uh, mask, distancing, um, and, and not gathering in crowds. All right. Uh, anything else from um, legal on the implications of the orange tier? Uh, this is Doug. I would just add, as Dr. Cody had mentioned, that um, you know, we're now following the state. So for the orange tier, more indoor business operations are open with more modifications at higher capacities. Okay. Um, Dr. Smith, uh, if I could just engage you for a moment. Um, I, I just want to, to point out uh, that the frustration that we are now feeling as a county about the approach that the state has taken to identifying the neediest areas in the state, only to discover that not one such area is in Santa Clara County, is, um, is one that I uh, feel uh, is, is quite legitimate because it, it uh, reflects uh, or mirrors the uh, concern I have expressed uh, during my tenure on the board about representing a portion of Santa Clara County where we have people with undeniable uh, need, uh, but they may exist in smaller numbers or in smaller pockets than in other parts of the county. So I, I, when I make my case from time to time for uh, the need in my district, it's, it's not because I'm suggesting that there aren't other places that are needier. There certainly are, and they certainly deserve our uh, attention and resources, but it's sort of an effort on my part to say, let's not forget uh, the, the more uh, modest among us, even in areas where the concentrations are not so great. And Dr. Smith, it seems to me that's what our concern or frustration is with the approach the state has taken on a statewide basis. Um, any, any observation about that, or you want to just let me uh, get that observation off my chest and let it go at that. Either way, truly. Well, since you opened up the mic for me. <laughs> Please. No, seriously, I want to have the conversation. Um, it, it's exceedingly disturbing because um, it does not recognize the modern era and reality that we don't have in most parts of the state intense uh, density of poverty for um, large swaths of geography. Um, you know, we're a more diverse, more mixed society than we were many years ago. And um, the Healthy Places Index was developed to identify um, census tracts where there was high health risk based on number of community or number of factors, uh, usually related a lot to poverty or near poverty. But the state used it um, regarding not census tracts, but zip codes, which are much larger than census tracts, and therefore mixed together communities that are on one side um, suffering from poverty and on the other side fairly well to do. And the most notable um, examples would be on the um, east and west sides of our county. Um, as you know very well, you are very close. Palo Alto's right next door to East Palo Alto, and they do not have the same uh, economic or social economic status. And if you mix them together, they look like they're doing pretty well on average, but that doesn't mean that East Palo Alto doesn't have great need. Um, and by using that system, the state really um, ignored a huge population of, of residents in great need. Um, and I will point out also that the 
scheme um, was really a two week plan. And theoretically, the state's scheme ended on the 15th, um, although they have not come out with another approach or another example. But it was supposed to be only two weeks of diverting dosages to those 400 plus zip codes. And then once they reached 2 million doses in all of the 400, the scheme ended and they met the 2 million doses, which they had already almost met when they started. And the two weeks expired on the 15th. So even in the best of worlds, if you can, if I can be as positive as I possibly could think about the idea, um, it was um, not a solution to equity, which was not going to be solved in two weeks. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. I, as it happens, I live in uh, the 94303 zip code, which is a zip code which uh, is in fact split between uh, East Palo Alto and Palo Alto, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there were not only city limit lines, but county lines, as you know, uh, as well. And um, uh, my friends in East Palo Alto and I, uh, over the years, have, have joked that uh, we get uh, what we call targeted mail that was uh, clearly targeted for uh, some other part of the zip code, uh, but that was done somewhat imprecisely, to your point. So, um, I mean, in my case, I get flyers from San Mateo County as an example uh, with respect to various programs and services that I uh, would not be eligible for because I'm a Santa Clara County resident. So, um, uh, enough on that, except, uh, and I, I asked this next question, not, not just so uh, any of us can vent, but because I really am um, anxious to know what the implications are. We, we are now in a period of time when the state has expanded the criteria uh, and, you know, I'm sure different folks have different points of view about whether that uh, new uh, list of folks who are eligible uh, for vaccines is or isn't the right uh, parsing of uh, criteria, but we know we've got a whole lot more folks who are eligible than we have vaccine to give out. What are the implications of that? Uh, I mean, the obvious implication is you got a bunch of people who are disappointed and or angry, but are there operational slash logistical implications to that as well? Yes, there are a lot of operational uh, implications because as uh, Dr. Cody pointed out, um, our entire team headed by um, Dr. Tong has um, to plan in advance, quite a bit of an advance, in order to have sufficient staff and mechanics at particular locations to meet the need. And we plan based on the number of appointments, and that is based upon the number of dosages. So. Um, there are inherent mismatches because of the scarcity of doses. So we have people um, not uh, totally busy on one day, but very busy on another day and not enough staff sometimes in some locations, too many staff in other locations because we find out um, our dosages on a week by week basis and so you really have very little time to plan and very and it's a big operation so right. it causes lots of inefficiency and anger among patients and frustration among caregivers that they can't provide the service that's needed all right last question and uh, then uh, we'll go to the public see if there are any public speakers and uh once we're uh done there we will uh do a formal motion if need be to receive the report. Um, how's the Mountain View site going? Uh, and I'm asking now more in my role as a district supervisor uh, as opposed to the uh, member of this committee. It's uh, going um, well, uh, given the fact that we have restricted numbers based on um, not enough doses for first doses, we're still giving 
second doses in appropriate uh, numbers. I don't know what the last count was yesterday, um, but I think it was in the uh, 1700 to 2000 range. But most of those are second doses, so it's difficult to get um, sufficient first doses. All right. Uh, I want to move on, just mindful of the rest of the uh, uh, agenda today and uh, respect people's time. Let me turn to the clerk and ask uh, if we have public speakers on this item. We currently have two speakers. Let's ask them to both step up here from there. Okay, our first speaker is Wesley Mukoyama. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, yes, uh, to piggyback on uh, Dr. Smith, uh, we uh, of the Behavioral Health Poll wrote a letter to the Board of Supervisors in September of last year asking for outreach to uh, with uh, wraparound services to the vulnerable populations, farm workers, uh, you know, uh, homeless, elderly, uh, isolated. Uh, undocumented and immigrants and LGBTQ, as well as the mentally ill, and uh, never got a response because we requested that uh, the uh, hospital and health committee uh, chair a um, summit, bringing all the other agencies together that matter like housing and behavioral health, uh, criminal justice, et cetera how we are going to uh, reach out to them. And that's a problem now. We can see that Latinx or even some of these people are not coming in. So we need to go out and, and talk to them. I asked uh, your aides, uh, Joe, about these and they they said, you well, well they, nobody's sure, but we would like uh, from the Behavioral Health Board a uh, formal answer. We haven't gotten anything and we also, uh, send a message to Dr. Smith's office. Next, a question I have is, uh, if someone is asymptomatic and goes in and gets a vaccin vaccination, I haven't got this answer from anybody yet, does the vaccination exacerbate or neutralize the illness? Uh, I have, nobody's been able to answer. I've talked to a lot of medical people about this and they, they said they didn't know. So maybe, uh, Dr. Cody can answer that for me, or somebody, uh, Dr. Smith can answer that as a medical person. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Michael Rogers. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, it's Mike Rogers. First thing I just want to commend the county staff and tremendous job, Dr. Marty and everybody else has done and uh, distributing vaccines. I look at a lot of counties data and I don't see any other county that's close to our efficiency in getting vaccines in the arms of people that they receive from the state and other sources. So um, great job there and great job of being ready for a lot more vaccines. It's really disheartening to see the state system be such a quagmire of complexity. And I wish uh, the county all the luck in trying to do all the parallel paths that uh, Supervisor Smithian has been suggesting for some time that we look at the, the future and try and plan for trying to get as much vaccine by any source possible. Um, on the metrics themselves, it's really appalling to see, even by zip codes, if you just look at severity of number of cases per capita and uh, hospitalizations and deaths, uh, it's very clear that El Viso and East, East San Jose and uh, Gilroy really stand out against any others in the state. Um, and, and there's a lot that follow closely behind it in Milpitas, East, East Palo Alto, East, Eastern Mountain View, and the rest of South County outside of Gilroy. So it's just, it's just appalling. It's appalling to see that we're now in our second week of uh, first vaccine injections being nearly impossible to get appointments for. So um, uh, finally, a comment on the 40% the and the goal that we just reached for the state of getting to 2 million. It looks like that the, their target is to continue that program to at least 4 million because there's another breakdown in the metrics to increase or to loosen the criteria for orange and yellow um, should they reach that 4 million. So that program uh, is bad. You know, unfortunately, that can put us at a disadvantage and it's hard to see uh, even locally, San Francisco's got a third of the residents have at least one injection while we are at a fourth. So we're 
disproportionate even to our neighbors here. So uh, good luck with continuing to drive the state to do better. That concludes our speakers, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Let me uh, let me turn then to uh, Supervisor Lee and see if uh, he is still on the line with us, and if so, uh, can simply offer a motion to receive the report. Yes, I have uh, no more questions, and I make a motion to receive the report. All right, then I will second, and we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, that uh, uh, would, take, would take us to item number eight, but we've already covered that item, and that takes us then to item number nine, and after that, we'll go to item number 11. So, um, Dr. Smith, who's going to report uh, to uh, the committee on item number nine, if I may ask? Um, that will be uh, Paul Lorenz, who will give you the background on item number nine. Thank you. Mr. Lorenz. Thank you, Chair Smitty and, uh, and members. Uh, so Dr. Nari Singh has the report. He has a, a brief update, and then we can get into questions and answers. Dr. Thank Singh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Um, as, it, as it's in the report, um, we had uh, presented two pilot programs to the committee in December of last year. Uh, both of those programs have received IRB approval in November, and they were launched uh, back in December. And these are the pilots where we would subsidize the medications to um, residents of our community, and we would have um, a pharmacist provide some type of a medication therapy management. The early results are in, and they are showing um, pretty good and encouraging results. So we have improved uh, safety of our patients. We have improved adherence, and we have helped uh, patients manage their refills. We do believe that we will have enough data to propose a model uh, of this um, program, and which would be safe, compliant, and cost-effective, and which will add value to our residents. Uh, and then I would take any questions or comments. Thank you uh, all, and forgive me for the noises in the back here as the phones ring and ping and uh, do their thing. Uh, Mr. Lorenz, anything else you'd like to add before uh, I weigh in on this one? Uh, nothing further at this time, Supervisor. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Singh, as you know, I I've been in touch with uh, uh, Mr. Lorenz on this one. And, and first, let me say thank you. I continue to think that there's real potential in uh, this pilot. I think it's, um, I'm obviously biased since I'm the person who brought the referral to the board in January of 2020, uh, excuse me, 20, yes, 2020. Uh, but uh, I, I think there's, I think when we're talking about uh, life essential drugs that are high cost, um, we're, we're at a place where we need to be thinking creatively, and I'm pleased that our county and the team are prepared to try and do that. That being said, as you might imagine, you know, this is a pride that I'm disappointed, frankly, by the low numbers of folks who are participating in the study. And from, from my perspective, here's how, here's how uh, I see it. You know, I, I started working on this in my office in the middle of 2019 so that we could do the due diligence and research we thought was necessary to bring a really thoughtful proposal since this is sort of a uh, cutting edge uh, approach uh, to our board, which we did in January of 2020. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a one or two page uh, effort. It was a, a serious effort to try and understand the complexities of this issue. The board approved the referral on a 5-0 vote, if I remember correctly. And now here we are 14 months later with uh, frankly just about 10% participation in the pilot that was supposed to have about 330 people in it, the larger of the two pilots in terms of numbers. Uh, that, that's, that's, 
deeply disappointing. Now, uh, I understood and, and, and appreciated the information you provided in the report about the efforts to which people went to try and find people to participate. So I, I want you to know I read it. I read it carefully. Uh, given my interest, I read it again. Uh, I, uh, but, you know, to, to 14 months later say, gee, we've got, you know, 30 odd folks maybe uh, in a pilot that was supposed to have 330, that's just, that's just not um, a terribly satisfying result. I'll let it go at that. More importantly, I worry that it puts our ability to move forward at risk. So I am pleased to hear that what you're telling me, and I think, Mr. Lorenz, this is consistent with what I heard previously, is that you think even with those modest numbers of participants and with the efforts to grow the number of participants in the pilots in the coming months, that you'll have enough data to stay on track and on timeline for uh, a follow-up, more robust implementation. Did I get that right? Correct. Okay. <laughs> And, and for me, that's a very important bottom line, as you might imagine. Now, I, um, I, I understand, or think I do, that the program was targeted at slash limited to uh, folks who were enrolled in the county's healthcare access program, uh, which, by the way, is something else we should be proud of and, you know, uh, say, uh, pleased to be able to, to make that happen. And I gather, although this part I'm less clear on, that there were some legal considerations that uh, uh, drove us towards limiting the program's participation to folks in the healthcare access program. I don't, I don't know if Mr. Press wants to weigh in here or not, but I guess one of my questions for all parties, and that would be, you know, Dr. Smith, Mr. Lorenz, Dr. Singh, and, and Mr. Press is, is one possible solution to the low rate of participation to say, let's offer the program to somebody besides that relatively small group of people. Let's start with you, Mr. Press, if I can, please. Well, sure. Um, as far as program design, as, as a, an attorney yourself would appreciate, we we don't we don't tell you this is what your program must be as a policy matter you start with policy and then depending on policy choices different legal considerations are or are not implicated so I, you know it, there's there's some fundamental questions that one would want to say so if you say well we want to we want to open this up this this program up to different groups outside of our healthcare access program. There are questions that need to be answered that will help guide the construction from a legal standpoint. For example, what is the county's expectation about uh, reimbursement from state and federal sources? What is the county's expectation as to what sorts of supplies of drugs could be used? 340B, other sources, things of that sort. Who outside of the healthcare access program would you like to try to reach? And what is, for those patients, what is their relationship with our county health system presently? And what expectation do we have that they would have with our health system in the future were we to provide them with these discounted drugs or, or copayment relief? So those are the questions that one needs to answer. And then depending depending on the policy choices that will then implicate different legal considerations as to how we can do that. Mr. Press, please, please take it as a sincere compliment when I say that was very artfully articulated. Uh, so let me, let me uh, respond in this way. Um, and, and first, uh, with carefully chosen words and quite seriously, and then I'm gonna be a little bit flipped. The carefully chosen words as I look at Mr. Lorenz and Dr. Singh are, uh, are these. I, I think, I don't know, but I think that as the conversations went back and forth between the health and hospital uh, pharmacy side and the county council's office, that 
giving raising perfectly legitimate concerns from the legal standpoint may have resulted in a approach to the pilot which was so cautious and limited that we were never going to be able to get sufficient numbers of participants i don't know that but that's sort of what it sounds like to me because the issues that you raise which i i certainly understand and you know respect the fact that they're real and important are as you describe them all issues that could and perhaps should be thoughtfully addressed before anybody goes forward, but that don't, quote, require that we limit ourselves to uh, the healthcare access program. Anything there that you want to take exception to? And you're the county council, I'm not. So please go right to it. Oh, sure. I, I thought you were directing this to Mr. Lorenz or Mr. Singh. Um, I, I would say my uh, my understanding was that for this initial pilot program, the question was, how do we construct a pilot program? So I, I guess I'm not, it seems to me just from, a, just from a policy slash scientific perspective, it seems like a fair uh, approach to say, let's start with a program that also targets the missing middle uh, from a larger healthcare perspective to try to address the missing middle from a pharmaceutical supply perspective. But I, I guess I'm just not following the I mean, question that you're asking. Sure. I, I apologize if I was uh, not, not clear. Let me try it this way. Um, I believe that based on the county's legal advice, excuse me, county council's legal advice, and I don't mean to suggest that the legal advice was anything other than top notch, Ms. Brown. But I believe that based on the county council's legal advice, the program has been too narrowly crafted and limited to a too small a population, folks in the healthcare access program, to produce sufficient numbers of people to meet the 330 target, which our health and hospital system established, not our office. So it, my, my request of uh, Mr. Lorenz and uh, Dr. Singh and through uh, Dr. Smith, of course, since he's the CEO, is uh, that we look at uh, expanding the uh, eligibility to go beyond the county's health care access program uh, participants. And if that means that there are questions that are legitimately raised as matters of concern by county council's office, we figure out how to address them. But but uh, I don't want to be in a position where we have unnecessarily reduced the potential pool of participants in a way that dooms us to having a, an insufficient number of folks in the sample. Is that clear? Yes, I, I, I just, I, I guess I'm struggling because I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling to find the, the legal question, frankly, in your question. Let me let me jump let me jump sure. in a little yeah, bit. I I think um, supervisor, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I think what what uh, we're talking about here is redefinition of our, our um, goalposts or you know the um, boundaries of our involvement. Um, I think that the reason we suggested initially a, a, a pilot project was to see what the demand would be. Um, I think what we've demonstrated is the demand at this point has been constrained by the processes of COVID, but the demand is not overwhelming, uh, which was, you know, the concern that, you know, we'd not get into a situation where we had an overwhelming demand. So I would suggest that we um, declare the pilot a success and continue on with the um, project as we expand the opportunity for access to the free drugs to the community that is in need um, rather than continuing on a pilot model. It, seems to me the pilot is unnecessary 
in terms of making a final decision? Well, Dr. Smith, you know, as you know, I'm always the one who says take yes for an answer. And this is one of those times when perhaps I should uh, heed my own counsel. But I, I really do want there to be a rigorous program. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Singh and he can't see me perhaps, but I'm looking right at him and, and saying, you know, look, I appreciate the intellectual integrity people are trying to bring to the pilot. I just think we have too narrowly uh, uh, defined eligible participants in the pilot. So I guess, Dr. Smith, my question would be, uh, is there a way that uh, I can have my cake and eat it too, uh, which is to say that we will continue with the, con you know, to to conclusion with the pilot, expanding it as we go, even as we make plans uh, to expand the program going forward. Because I think, you know, the, the goal here is not just to say, you know, let's, this is something the board's voted to do and therefore we got to do it. I, the, the goal really is to do this in a way that's that's medically rigorous. And, and you know, I, I know you know all that better than I. So can, is there a, a way to have it both ways. I see Mr. Lorenz looking like he might want to lean in if I'm reading his body language correctly. I think there's a way to have it both ways. Um, and particularly in a situation where right now, as you're well aware, um, the economics of healthcare are changing dramatically, states trying to implement CalAIM program, uh, the 1115 waiver got continued. So, um, and there's a whole different pot of funding coming for COVID healthcare and uh, lots of change going on in terms of the organizational structure of Medi-Cal. So I think we can, we can do both at the same time um, and realize that, you know, there are a lot of moving pieces. So our final ultimate total goal is to make sure that people who need these drugs get them independent of their ability to pay and make sure that we can provide them for them. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Dr. Smith. Uh, you know, as um, we've discussed in the past, uh, and, you know, uh, I think as I had a chance to discuss with Mr. Lorenz and, uh, uh, and as we're now talking with Dr. Singh, I think you know one of the one of the reasons you do a pilot is you find out what works and what doesn't, and you know that's uh, part of the process. So um, the, the the and then if the pilot needs to be tweaked in some way, and I've suggested what I think the issue is, uh, Dr. Smith, would it be practical to say uh, this being March that uh, we come back with a fleshed out. Uh, description of here's how we're going to move forward and a timeline and the timeline with a month by month or quarter by quarter description of what's going to happen so that there's some accountability built into it uh, for not just the rest of this year but next year as well at our next board meeting which is in April and if that's too soon we can say May um I would prefer May just because uh, I think it will take some effort on the part of the team. Um, so sure. what, what we'll I'm going to do back is I'm in May. ask that we do that in May uh, and that um, we then have monthly reports to the committee uh, that identify essentially whether we are or not on uh, track uh with the timeline that we look at uh from you all in may Does that sound like a way we can proceed and make sure there are no surprises or disappointments down the line sure let me make sure i heard it correctly you said come back in may to the full board and then my, my regularly apologies. if i misspoke i meant to come back to the committee uh, uh i may have misstated what what my thinking was oh okay sure yeah we can do that absolutely yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I think if you come back to the committee in May, uh, and uh, then if there's follow up work, we can do it in June before summer recess, if there is a summer recess this year, uh, and um, then uh, as I say, ask for monthly reports, which um, uh, apropos of the conversation we had earlier 
around Supervisor Lee's uh, request for a report, uh, we can determine later whether those can go on consent or whether they actually need to be heard. But I think the starting point is to say, okay, we've assessed where we are. Uh, we've seen that there are some limitations to the way the pilot has been structured. We're only at 10% of the target number. Uh, and um, pleased again to hear that uh, Dr. Singh thinks that that's uh, enough to start drawing some uh, intelligent conclusions from. That's good. But let's let's get a plan in place for how we move forward and look at it. May sign off on it at the committee level, and uh, also uh, at that time look at how that segues uh, from being a pilot into a full blown program, however modest its uh, early days may be. And thank you for uh, charting a path there. I I could tell I wasn't uh, articulating this in a way that was. Um, comprehensible uh, for uh, Mr. Press on the legal side, but I think I think we're there. Okay, oh. we'll so do. let's see um, uh, if Supervisor Lee is still with us and has any comments or questions. Uh, no question, thank you. All right, and let me check with the clerk, see if we have any speakers on this item. No speakers, Mr. Chair. Thank you, then Supervisor Lee, if we can get a motion uh, to uh, uh, receive the report, direct staff to report back in May with a uh, plan for uh, further implementation of the pilot plus a successor program plus a timeline running through December of 2022. That would be appreciated. Yes, thank you. Uh, so moved. All right, thank you for that motion. I'll second. Uh, and uh, I'm going to say thank you to uh, Dr. Singh and to Mr. Lorenz. And uh, gentlemen, uh, notwithstanding my frustration here, please know how much I appreciate the fact that you're trying to craft something that's really, um, I think, very compelling in its potential, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've struggled to launch it uh, during this uh, challenging time. I see Mr. Santiago leaning in as well. I just wanna make sure that I'm not precluding him from participating on this item. I think he's, I think he's, he's chomping at the bit to get to the next item. All right, then we'll ask the question. Clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That takes us to uh, uh, item number 11. And I will uh, look to you, uh, Mr. Santiago. There you are. You've moved on my screen. Forgive me. Go to it. Yes. And uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair Simidian and Supervisor Lee. Uh, as usual, every month we have uh, written operational updates from our departments and my director's report. I give you a little bit of a background in terms of the whole person care, as well as the Cal AIM and some of the critical milestones and timeframes around that. Uh, given the lateness of the hour, it, uh, it's really up to you how you want to handle these. We could go one by one or, or whether we just uh, prefer to, to ask questions based on, on your reading of those reports. I think um, uh, I, I will defer to Supervisor Lee on how he'd like to proceed, but I think what I do is I don't have a lot of questions having looked at this, except what I would like to do is say on each of these items, ask uh, whoever the reporting uh, team member is here to lean forward and say, Supervisor, if you don't remember anything but this, please remember this one thing. So like have them bottom line, underline, headline it, whatever cliche we can try it out, but what's the one thing uh, that uh, from the many pages of reports that they would like us to pluck out or think is most uh, important or relevant? And it can be either a, an area where we have some challenges or someplace where, you know, uh, something's worked wonderfully well and we just want to make sure we don't lose sight of it while we're problem solving in other areas. Okay? Okay. Sounds good. I don't know if Supervisor Lee has any questions. Well, let's start with uh, 11A. Supervisor Lee, any questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Then I'll turn to uh, you again, Mr. Uh, uh, Santiago, and say, what's what's the what's the headline of the day here? Well, in that report, as you know, we're working as uh, Dr. Smith indicated. We have a one-year extension of the waiver, so we're we're. Uh, negotiating the agreements with all our partners through December of uh, the calendar year. And then, of course, working in the transitions collaboratively uh, related to the state plans on Calhoun. So that's pretty much the headline. 
And the initial hope was that the waiver would be for a longer period of time, allowing more certainty both for us and for our partners, yes? Correct. Uh, obviously, not with the Biden administration. We have a friendly administration in the White House. So we're looking, obviously, to continue many of these efforts on, on another five-year cycle. But it's going to take some time for the new administration to, to settle in and then, obviously, to, for us to process it through the state of California. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, Supervisor Lee, I'm going to just ask you to uh, chime right in at any point if uh, you would like to. I'll, I'll come to you on each item. But if something prompts your uh, interest or engagement, please feel free to speak up. Um, we have heard from the public health officer on uh, 11B. So let's go to 11C, which is the verbal report from the CEO at the medical center. Chair Simidian and uh, Supervisor Lee, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding our operational report. Let me, let me ask you to do the same thing, uh, Mr. Lorenz, which is, you know, if, if uh, if we were walking past each other down the hall, what's the one thing you'd want to make sure that you told me when I said what, what's happening at BMC these days? The, uh, the effort around COVID-19 and our ability to care for the patients that are presenting continues to go well. Uh, I, I think the most important thing to note is that the system is slowly recovering relative to making sure that we're providing access to, to our community, both in terms of specialty care and hospital services. And in fact, uh, many of our um, departments are seeing an increase in the number of patients utilizing and accessing healthcare. Um, so I think over the next several months, you'll see a gradual increase in our ability to, to ensure that people are getting the healthcare that they need. Thank you very much. Supervisor Lee, anything? Nope, thank you. Thank you. That takes us to uh, 11D, which is to receive the report from the Director of the Behavioral Health Services Department. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Simidian and Supervisor Lee, Sherry Terrell with Behavioral Health. Uh, the one thing I would want to highlight is with respect to Innovation Project 15, and that's our community mobile response project. We've been very actively working with the community and stakeholders to be able to move this forward. Um, on Friday, March 14th, our public comment period ended. Um, we went forward with a um, MHSA stakeholder leadership meeting on March 15th, and some of the public comment was vetted there during the meeting, and it was decided that a few additional meetings are needed to further vet um, some of that feedback prior to moving uh, the draft plan forward. So we will continue to hold a couple of more meetings, and we're, we'll be delaying the public hearing on the draft plan and coming back uh, to the board probably toward the end of April with a draft plan regarding community mobile response. That concludes my comments. Thank you. And Mr. Rao, just uh, uh, check in. We are planning to see uh, you and some of the folks in your team on the 24th of March for a special meeting where the committee will try to do a more in-depth dive on uh, the assisted outpatient treatment issue, sometimes referred to as Laura's Law, and uh, the obligations that we have under AB 1976. Yes? That is correct. We'll see you on the 24th. Thank you for that. Thank Supervisor you. Lee, anything else on uh, 11D? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right, 11E, Valley Health Plan. Hi, Supervisor Smithian and Supervisor Otto. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. Um, I think the one take home is that the COVID-19 stimulus bill that was passed uh, recently had significant subsidies to really reduce the cost for many, many Americans for Covered California. And the state Covered California program is pushing very hard and, and wants all of its partner health plans to really do an enormous amount of outreach. They have extended open enrollment until the end of this year. And so we're expecting, um, as, especially as the economy recovers, and we certainly hope it does, an increase in Covered California members. And um, you'll see a lot more outreach from Valley Health Plan. All right. And before I ask uh, Supervisor Lee if he's got anything, uh, we doing better on wall time these days, uh, Ms. Lather? Yes. <clears throat> wall times have gone down. Volume has gone down significantly as well. All right. And uh, Dr. Miller wants to say a few words on our stroke update. Thank you. 
Yeah, I can give it very briefly and just say that uh, we summarized calendar year 2020, um, and there are several key features of that. One is it's the first year of our new strategy for stroke triage to comprehensive stroke centers. Um, that was complicated somewhat by COVID-19, but not um, uh, but not neutralized. The effect of COVID-19 on cardiovascular disease and EMS was demonstrated, although uh, uh, we continue the course. Um, the other factor in 2020 is it's the first year we've had uh, complete and independent visibility on uh, hospital outcome data uh, that we can ourselves manage. Uh, therefore, we can say that in looking at uh, outcomes uh, based upon that data, that the, uh, the, the strategy for stroke triage is consistent with the science um, and is working the way we intended it to be. Thank you. And uh, uh, Supervisor Lee, hang in there. I promise I'll hit, I'll hit your way in a moment, but I did want to turn to Dr. Smith and say, could you remind us all uh, just uh, where we are in the ambulance contract process, uh, which has been a recurring topic of conversation? May have stepped away for a moment, understandably. Anybody else want to share uh, the status on that one? Jackie, do you want to give an update? The contract, the ambulance contract. Uh, yes. We are beginning our stakeholder meetings for uh, beginning uh, to work on the options for the next contract. And the current contract runs uh, how, how much longer, Ms. Lather? Until 2024. Okay, that, thank you. I, that was... That was a leading question, absolutely on purpose. I just, I sort of, but I wanted to make sure that given as much time as it takes to put these things together, that we were in fact already starting those conversations. So pleased to hear that that's happening. Supervisor Lee, anything on this item or? Nope, thank you. Thank you. All right, then let's uh, go to uh, Custody Health. Yes, good afternoon, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Uh, one thing I'd like you to uh, like to say with you is that we have already vaccinated our patients that are 65 years and older. Uh, we were notified on February the 25th that we can start vaccinating uh, in mass or the rest of our patients. However, we have come up with a shortage uh, through uh, the county, and so we have delayed that. We did pilot, however, vaccinating 115 patients, and so. Um, that actually went well. We have lessons learned, and we will vaccinate another 300 patients with the Johnson vaccine uh, starting on Friday the 19th uh, through the 20th. And so once we get the go-ahead that we have more vaccinations for the patients, uh, we will have max, uh, mass vaccination of our patients, and we're excited to uh, get our patients vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you. And how, how are you doing on uh, staff, if I may ask? Uh, I know that's been a challenge and a recurring conversation. So what percentage of staff do we think have been vaccinated? Correct. Uh, for custody health services, we're about 60%. However, we're working with Valley Medical Center. Uh, they're building a tab for us and ready set so that we can uh, receive monthly reports. And so we'll be getting uh, monthly numbers of vaccinated patients and stratified by demographics and by department and managers. And so we are doing, uh, just for, uh, for your awareness, we're continuing with the daily uh, antigen by next testing. And so all staff, it's mandatory uh, that if you have not vaccinated, that you still need to go through the daily antigen testing. If you have vaccinated and you can present your vaccination card, then we have reduced that down to once a week. And so last month we um, vaccinated about 15, excuse me, we tested about 15,000 staff. And so we're averaging about 550 staff a day who are doing a daily testing. And once they present their vaccination cards, they can reduce that down to once a week. Got it. And and one last question, even if it's somewhat anecdotal, uh, Dr. J, that the question would be, do you have any sense of what's driving the vaccine hesitancy among the staff members? Um, to that point, we had a town hall meeting and that was moderated and videotaped as well as we had Dr. George Hahn, who is a deputy uh, public health officer. Uh, he moderated a Q&A for all staff. We also are following up with a vaccination hesitancy survey, and we're asking those very questions. And so once we get that survey results, it's going to go through the end of the week, and then we'll aggregate that, and we'll find out more information. Uh, there is a lot of myths out there that we're trying to eradicate. 
Uh, we also are using the video from the town hall meeting as additional education for staff who may have missed that uh, town hall meeting. Uh, but right now we're just trying to um, get information out in front of folks, uh, educate as much as we can. All right, uh, thank you for that. I, I uh, do think it would be, um, it, well, it would certainly be interesting and hopefully helpful for our uh, committee to understand more fully what the basis of the hesitancy is. Uh, you know, when I uh, talk to folks about this issue, they scratch their head and say, for God's sakes, if I were in a facility with, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of folks who are confined in an enclosed space, I, I'd be the first uh, to line up for a vaccine uh, as a staff member. And yet, you know, somewhere between a third and 40 percent are, are not. So um, understanding that dynamic more fully, I think, Absolutely. would be. Uh, thanks so much. Supervisor Lee, any questions for custody health? I guess I would offer myself as a guinea pig. If they don't believe it's safe, I will be the one to show them live that uh, I'll be happy to get the vaccine. All uh, right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for that offer, duly noted. And uh, that takes us to item 11H, which is the report from uh, our uh, uh, advocate on federal health policy and budget uh, issues, uh, Bert Margolin. Mr. Margolin, thanks for hanging in with us again. Sure. What should we know? Well, I have three or four uh, points that I can make uh, briefly. The first is that the American Rescue Plan, its passage, we all know that there are tens of billions of dollars for COVID response, but it also has a number of features designed to strengthen the Affordable Care Act. It changes the way subsidies operate in, in the Affordable Care Act so that people at a higher income level can receive federal uh, support in buying uh, insurance. It also in attempts to entice the 12 states that have not yet expanded Medicaid to do so by giving them a 5% bump in their uh, matching rate. Um, in addition to legislative action, uh, and again, this was a very significant bill, the American Rescue Plan, the Biden administration is using its um, authority administratively to promote uh, changes in health care. The most significant example of that was the action last week to rescind the public charge rule. This is the, the rule that, wa that was going to and was in fact chilling or, or discouraging uh, legal immigrants from uh, accessing Medicaid and other services because of the fear they would not be able to get a green card. Um, that's been rescinded by the administration. Um, next quick point I would make involves um, the next uh, reconciliation package, which is gonna be on infrastructure. Most people think infrastructure and they think um, air, uh, roads and bridges and highways and they, they don't think healthcare, but there's actually going to be a significant section in this infrastructure package that will deal with healthcare infrastructure. And it's first gonna be discussed publicly next week in the um, House um, Energy and Commerce Committee where they will hear the what's called the Lift America Act, which is their section of the infrastructure package has a number of provisions in it, but there's a healthcare section that authorizes, for instance, $6 billion to expand laboratory systems and health information systems. There's another section of this bill that, re, that uh, restores or recreates the Hill Burton program, giving, giving grants and loans to hospitals for renovations in exchange for certain commitments to serve the, uh, the uninsured. There's also more money for modernization and improvements of clinical labs, a whole series of sections dealing with healthcare. Um, and we need to track and follow that as we will and see what the impact will be on Santa Clara County. The last point I will make is, is a political observation about a development in Congress that's advancing rapidly that may affect the way Congress deals with legislation overall. And that is that earmarks have returned after an absence of 10 years, in fact, the House Republicans voted today to participate in the earmark, earmark process. Democrats took the lead. Republicans were uncertain. House Republicans said, yes, we want to participate. And the, the last point I would make about this is the reason why this impacts uh, legislation in general and the, the, the effort to overcome gridlock is prior, um, when earmarks existed uh, in prior years, there were many fewer members of Congress who would vote no on everything because there would always be these district projects in these big packages that would be affected if they voted no. 
and they there was an incentive for them to cooperate with the leadership, both majority and minority, because of the district projects. When earmarks went away in 2011, a lot of things went awry in the Congress, but the frequency of impasse and gridlock uh, you know, accelerated quite rapidly, in part because more and more members would vote no on everything and basically tell the leadership, you have no hold over me. There's nothing that I care about in these packages. So earmarks returning is not a solution to congressional gridlock. Uh, there's also this debate about the filibuster in the Senate that's even more significant, but it's part of this ongoing process of trying to get the Congress to operate uh, more efficiently and with greater collegiality. That's my report. Happy to respond to questions. Thank you. Let me just ask you to, um, if you have any more expansive thoughts about the opportunity that is being taken to, I'll call it, tweak the Affordable Care Act, um, my recollection from uh, my own research, but listening to you now over these many years, is that uh, there was never a willingness with uh, a different administration or, or majority in Congress to, uh, to address areas that uh, perhaps cried out for a fix it uh, in the Affordable Care Act because uh, was uh, repeal and replace was the uh, the mantra. And so thoughts about how significant these seemingly minor, but maybe not so minor in their totality of impact fixes might be to the long-term viability of the Affordable Care Act. I hope that wasn't too obscure or roundabout question. No, it's a very, very clear question. And it, it's, un I mean, they're, they're not minor. They're actually viewed as somewhat significant. They're not, it's not a massive overhaul, but the affordability has been a big issue in the Affordable Care Act. And uh, changing the formula by which people can get federal subsidies so that people at a slightly higher income. So this is what Governor Newsom did in California a year or two ago. He enhanced, uh, he created state subsidies in effect for people above 400% of poverty. So this will lead to more people buying insurance, yeah. the Affordable Care Act. We don't know how many yet, but it's uh, judged to be somewhat significant potentially. In getting these last 11 or 12 states that are not in the Medi-Cal expansion or Medicaid expansion to, to become part of the expansion can be quite significant. It could involve uh, multiple millions of people who don't have coverage now acquiring coverage. So the two, these two provisions taken together um, could reverse the, um, the damage that was done in the Trump administration. Enrollment actually dropped by about 2 million in the Affordable Care Act as a result of all these small changes administratively that were done. So it's not gonna be a complete fix. There's more to be done. The public option debate has to occur. There are other larger fixes, but it's it's not insignificant what was just done. To, um, you, you referenced the California effort to provide greater subsidies for folks at somewhat higher income levels. Does that mean that the federal action will be minimal if uh, at all relevant in their impact in California or um, or is there a California impact from this federal action? So that's an excellent question. I don't. I haven't seen the analysis yet to see how um, the federal change impacts the state change. It will have less impact in California because Governor Newsom already made a partial adjustment. In states where nothing has been done, it will have greater impact. But I, again, I'm waiting to see an analysis as to how the two interact. I haven't seen it yet. Mr. Margolin, is that something, uh, and I'm looking at Mr. Santiago on my screen at the same time, that's something you might share with us as an off agenda report, as we call it here in yes. uh, County. Thank you. I think knowing to the extent it's knowable uh, in advance, and I understand sometimes we just have to see how these things play out, but knowing to the greatest degree possible whether this is a, a meaningful change to California residents and specifically Santa Clara County residents uh, will be important. Mr. Santiago has been kind enough to work with me over the years on expanding access to health insurance and where insurance products are not available, expanding access directly to care. So he's not surprised that I'm asking this question because he knows I'm always looking to see 
can we find a way to pull a few more thousand folks into the insurance pool? Uh, and in this case, through covered California. So we get that off agenda. That would be much appreciated. Thank you. We will do that. Supervisor Lee, uh, anything else on this item? A no further question. Thank you. All right, then let me turn to the clerk and see if we have any hardy souls who are still with us who would like to speak on item number 11. We have no speakers on this item, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, uh, I am uh, surprised actually that we are as close to on time as we are, 503. Uh, I believe, uh, turning to the clerk, that covers all items on our agenda, yes? It does, sir, yes. All right, then I will say thank you to all parties for a very substantive meeting today, and um, we will adjourn to our special meeting, which I referenced just a bit earlier on Wednesday, March 24th, when we will take up the topic of assisted outpatient treatment, also known as Laura's Law. Thank you all, and have a good day. Take care. Oh, Jesus.